two uh, semester uh, one of a semester two senior English class. And so we would then just evaluate how many kids want to take advantage of that opportunity. That's it for graduation requirements of 2021. I did send out an email today. I don't know if anybody was aware of it. So um, had some overall feedback on that. I don't know if we wanted to talk about that or not. Oh. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how many, if, well, if you know, how many students last year took advantage of, of that, um, that process to reevaluate for graduating with 21 credits? It, I believe it was just under 10. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't, you were sitting in on the committee, weren't you, Paula? Yeah. And so the follow up is, are there students that did not fulfill graduation requirements because they didn't take advantage of that process? The, the, the counselors and grade level principal were combing through opportunities and making sure that the students that could have taken advantage of that opportunity were aware of the opportunity. Okay. Trina, do you have anything to add to that? I no. You that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. I just want to make sure that there's not a, even though there is a process, sometimes when people mm -hmm. see a hill, they don't want to climb it and they would rather just, I'm not going to climb that hill. We'll yeah. see what happens, but really they probably just need help climbing the hill. So I just want to make sure that we had that discussion. Yep. Thank you. A really good, really good question. And I have to say that I, the MHS, MHS staff did a fantastic job of doing exactly that, of identifying students who did potentially have that risk and then providing that support to them. It was a easy process to come into with it being my first year to understand the intent of it, the data that was needed and all of those pieces. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kent State High School Activity Association sent out an email um, probably within the hour saying that there was going to be a statement this Friday or guidance that they were going to provide consideration and guidance. I believe um, there was their was their wording and they're now looking with Governor Kelly's orders being issued this upcoming uh, uh, next week. They're looking at the models and plans and they will not make an announcement on Friday. So um, there was a moment for about 45 seconds at the very end of, the, of Governor Kelly's uh, address that they were talking about Keisha and we're going to be looking into um, the guidance on going forth with any um, workouts or any gatherings. It's, uh, I'm, we're still unclear on that, so we're going to be seeking out uh, more information um, and how to decipher that. I, I would add to that that the, the position of, of the district at this point in time, and, and I want to clarify it on, on this a little more, would be that the intent of remote learning is for the, the student to limit their, their contact with other, other students. And we would see that as being consistent with athletics so that with the remote learning option at this point in time, it would be that those students would not be eligible for athletics, but with the on-site learning, they would be. And also with the contingencies, the hybrid and distance learning, since those would be imposed by the district on those families, that they would still be eligible if Keisha allows them. Mm -hmm. But we, we have to wonder if you're not in your head yet. You know, is it really going to be wise for them to be coming together for athletics when everybody's on distance learning? So yeah. those are the things we'll be looking at. But our, our position now would be, if you're at school, then you're eligible. If you're not at school, then you're not. And uh, but but we'll we'll clarify that down the road more too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The the next steps that that we have will not be a surprise to anybody. It will be studying studying the governor's executive order. What's what's in there? How does it apply to us? How does it apply uh, with the guidance we got from the Kansas State Department of Education from the Board of Education. Is that consistent? To continue to refine our, re our reopening plan uh, from where we're at now, to continue to communicate with the stakeholders, get out the information as we, as we move forward pl with plans, uh, have an opportunity for people to ask their questions and get those questions answered. 
remain in contact with Riley County Health Department. Haven't even talked about that today, but they continue to provide, you know, leadership, encouragement, support, direction for us. Uh, every question we have, they help us with, and they help us gauge where we are with the plan, with what they expect to be, and uh, consistent with what I believe the director from, not directive, but the board in agreement with administration would be, we follow the local health officials' guidance in what we do, and we seek their, uh, uh, their input on anything as we move forward. Ob obtaining feedback from families and staff, want to continue doing that. We can do, a, I think, a better job of it now that we have something more tangible for them to look at, digest, criticize, uh, whatever they need to do. And then prepare for the August 5th board meeting with what are we going to bring back next time we meet with the board. And we realize this is a lot. We kind of off, off to the races. And it's a lot to digest. And we've been living and breathing it. But lots of people watching this, the board getting all of this, we realize it's, you know, the old fire hose. And we appreciate you know, just, just the opportunity to rush through it so that at least we can get it out in front of people. And we wanna, we've got 18 minutes to go over any questions anybody have, knowing that we're all in this together, just trying to make the best plan possible. So with that, can we open it up? Absolutely, Absolutely. we'll open it up for questions and I'll start with Kristen, I see your hand. Uh, Dr. Wade, I, the one thing I was hoping to hear that I haven't heard yet, maybe we just haven't gotten to it, is some idea for parents who are considering online learning for their students, what type of situations we're talking about with contingency A and contingency B. Um, what type, I mean, I know we're not going to say we have 332 positives and we're going to trigger this, but can we give people an idea if school was to start Monday, are we still not in anywhere near the type of situation our community would need to be in to get to A? I guess I think people need okay. to know where we would fall today and how much more it would get worse before we would trigger a contingency. Okay, thank you. That very critical question for lots of people. And and thank you for prefacing it with, it's not going to be like a formula that once 42 kids get tested positive, all of a sudden school shut down. It's not that way. It's going to be similar to snow day decisions that input from multiple sources, looking at the trends, lots from Riley County Health and you know where are we going. Uh, so it, it, we will be having ongoing communication, looking at those things. Uh, right now, because uh, I, I did hear your question about, you know, if we were starting, almost like if we were starting school tomorrow, which model would we be in? Before I answer that, let me say that is an important part would be we're, our intent is not to be that we start on, even though option one is on site and remote, that doesn't mean that our first step would be on site. We could start with hybrid. We could even start with distance learning where nobody's on site. At this point in time, I would, uh, I'm looking at you guys, because this is the team, you know, and this is part, part of what we talk about. I would say we're somewhere, somewhere between hybrid and distance, whether we're looking at being proactive and preventive or reacting to the, the, the situation in our community right now as it currently stands compared to other comparable communities. Can I add to that, Dr. White? I think when we had to um, go completely remote to continuous learning in the spring, it wasn't because we chose that. Mm. So I think that's another part of the equation is that if another entity has to come in because what's happening in the community, I mean, it, our schools could be fine in terms of cases, but what's happening in the community, which we have no control over, could implicate that we have to shut down. So I think it's even hard to say what our idea is because it's not just about what happens within the classrooms it's about what happens in the community at large thank you <laughs> anybody else on the team because any of you any of us yeah, could answer and, well and I, I, th I think a big thing on this is where we are staff wise you know and if we have a decent number of staff be it bus drivers food service teachers i mean you you name the position 
you know, if you get a mandated quarantine with a certain percentage of your staff, we might not have the in-person capabilities anyway. So, I mean, very, very well, it could be staff. A lot of these safety precautions, you know, people, what, what, what you hear along the way, well, it doesn't impact kids as much. It doesn't, you know, they're, they can weather through it. We have adults that work at school and that that's by and large what we do. And if we can't keep our adults healthy, we can't serve our kids. And, and that's going to be a group we have to step up and do things for the kids might be okay, but we got to protect the adults of all ages with all kinds of backgrounds and coming in with, with a lot of things under their hats. So I, I, I think our staff will be a important thing on, on the district as far as what we can do too. I would add too that there's other factors because I was just saying, uh, we're not ready right now for hybrid. That's where that part with the training of staff that the, the, the work we do in the next couple of weeks is going to be critical for our success to avoid what we had before and go to where we want to go. Right now, I think we would have better luck in succeeding with distance and with hybrid. And that's, that's just another factor. Agree. I want to follow up on that and then I'll come to you, Kurt, if that's okay. Just to piggyback on Kristen's question and maybe make sure that we're clear about this, I think that one of the things that is that community fear or concern when we're asking parents to start making the choice, and I understand and I'm great with the fact that it doesn't have to be that I make my decision for my own kids on July 20th. I might not be ready for that. But when I do eventually have to pick a box, because I will, that picking the on-site box does not automatically mean that on day one, every kid who chose on-site learning will be physically present in the building. I think our community and our teachers and our parents are all needing to make sure that we're all on the same page that what we will be looking at to make that decision are those community safety factors, our staffing factors, our capacity to actually deliver what we need to deliver. And so that when I check that, if I check that on-site box, for it, it depends on how risk averse a person is. There are people who will check that box and have no stress about that whatsoever because they're just ready. But there's folks who, who will hover over that and go back and forth 10 times because as much as they want their kid to be in the building, they're concerned about the safety of it. And so I think what I'm hearing from you, and I just want to confirm that we're all on the same page, and Eric is nodding and you're nodding, mm -hmm. is that we are going to be making those decisions based on those criteria, even though we can't come out and say X number of positive tests or X percentage of whatever, that those features are gonna be something that are going to be somewhat fluid depending on the situation. Is that a fair? Mm -hmm. Because one of the, when I was answering your question, I was thinking, first thing I thought was, what does Julie say? What does Andrew say? What does MH MHK task force say about this issue? Which would they recommend and why? Because we know they follow the, the data and that's what we've got to go by is where are we at? Where does it look like we're going? What's the severity? What's the intensity? What's the numbers? Where are they at? What's the age levels of those, those people that are affected? All of those kind of things. So all of yeah. those come in, come into play as yeah. well. Plus, we, we recognize, too, I want to be candid about, we recognize there's a trust factor involved here. When people check that on-site box, there's an element of they trust us to enforce that we're going to use the sanitizer, we're going to use masks, social distancing as much as possible, admitting up front it's not always going to be six feet apart, but we will do the best that we can with it. And just some of those things that... We've talked a lot about the assurances and the promises made, promises kept to people that we're going to do those things. I know another thing the health department was concerned that they want to track is spread within. You know, if they see certain factors that we're, we're spreading within, that they'll be more aggressive with that. And I, I think to help with Carla's thing, our, you can't just check the box and that's it either. 
because I, I think people need to prepare and people keep telling, well, we need to know or parents need to know so they can make plans. Well, there are some of these things we can't plan. Our, our plans are, it could be, it could be on site, it could be hybrid, it could be distance, depending on the thing. And I think we need to mentally prepare as a community that if you choose the on site option, you could be in any three of those things. If you want to control your piece of it, the answer is remote and then you're in control because that stays the same throughout the whole process. So for people that need certainty, it's there. It might not taste very good, but it's there. The other ones we need to be prepared to shift in and out based on the need in the community. And we did start this process thinking more of a long, along the lines of a menu approach that here's all the different options that parents and students could have and they check and it becomes more individualized like we're striving toward. But as we looked at the factors of, of, of hygiene, of transportation, of food service, of social distancing, of all those different things, it became apparent pretty quickly that we're gonna to have to narrow those options or we're not gonna succeed at anything. So, it, well, it might, might appear controlling or dictatorial or whatever, it's out of necessity, not because we don't wanna allow those other things. We just, we look at what, what it would cost and the ripple effect and we just, we just can't support all the different options we'd like to do. Kurt. Well, great questions. I, I kind of like Jardine's comment about the, what's going on in the community. And, and, and I, I guess I kind of anticipate that I think in, in my mind, a majority of the people are going to probably select in, in school where they like it or not. Cause, cause a lot of families, they both have to work and not, not all the parents can stay home and, and, uh, and work. I've had some. Well, you know, I've had some experience. Some of my coworkers that, you know, and not only that, you know, some of our some of the people I know can work from home, but to have a, you know, especially a, a grade school age, age children, you know, they're. I mean, it's kind of hard to be able to try and work and have those children at home as well. So, that would be my, just my anticipation. But, um, but the real question, I guess, I really want to make is: so, are are we are we saying are we going to still open August eighth and or August twelfth? and be all remote or we're not gonna do anything at all until the eighth. We don't believe we can open at all. Um, I mean, I, start yeah. school until after Labor Day. I mean, I thought, I mean, I did catch the comment that it gives us a little more time to prepare. Mm -hmm. And plus we have all the new hardware that we're buying. It would be, be easier for us to get in the hands of the kids. But I just wanted to make sure that was- Right now we would assume we can still do some training and some planning with some people um, to make that possible. As, but we'll have to wait and see what that order says too. I, I think she wants to set us up for success when we open up afterwards. Thank there. you for asking that, Kurt. I bet people that are listening may have had that exact same question too. So right now, no, the anticipated start date will be September 8th, of course, depending on where we are with everything at that point. Okay. Daryl had a question. Yeah, kind of add on, it's probably what Kurt was going. This is a moving target, it seems like, all the time. So stating that, if there's a loophole on Monday and they say, okay, you can do distance learning, but you can't do in school or whatever, or they just annihilate it altogether, how close are we to being ready to do distance learning 100%, even if it's not the 12th, it's the 15th? How close are we within that time frame? if we had that opportunity to go 100%. Oh, I, probably not close enough for the 12th for everyone. I, I think certain people on our staff would be ready to go by then, not all. I think we need a little time, but I think it would be before the Labor Day. Am I comfortable with that? I, smiling eyes? Okay. <laughs> you know, they say 80% of communication is nonverbal and without your face, it's... <laughs> but that does go back to the fact that trainings have been planned, that these two are working with individual buildings on those steps that go into that remote learning. It's not going to just happen as a result of the boot camp last week. It is that continuous professional development that was planned. And sure, now we can make it even better and more robust and bring in outside sources and make, it's gonna be even better. But I mean, I agree 100% with Eric that we're really close. We would have been close to that 15th date, but a couple more days would have helped a month, 
I don't know what we can do in that time. Okay. Brandy? We're going to keep the sense of urgency. Okay, I just want to get that out there. We're not going to let up just because all of a sudden we might have more time. That's a recipe for disaster. Uh, my question is for Dr. Wade. Um, I just want to verify, did you say um, for athletics, uh, on here, on the reopening plan, it says that they would be eligible either way for on-site learning or remote learning, that they would be eligible to participate in athletics. Um, is, I just wanted a verification. Is that true? Or if they do remote yeah, thank, learning, they will not be eligible? That's, that, that was the piece that I was saying. Probably want to ch we'll change that. Uh, both say eligible to participate in athletics pending and we were waiting for the case of requirements but i would uh, with our our conversations we've had internally that on site would be eligible remote would not be eligible okay and i think that's consistent with past interpretations for for Keisha for what's like manhattan virtual academy those students are not eligible for the athletics so on site would be eligible Remote would not be eligible. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. it, correct, team? Okay. Jardine, did you have a question? Just a, or not a comment. I just wanted to say that I have spent all summer ducking and dodging parents and neighbors, <laughs> um, teachers. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm avoiding you. Um, everybody has wanted to know since March 16th, what are we going to do April 12th or August 12th? And I am so impressed with the amount of work you guys have put in. I am so proud. I'm getting like emotional. I'm so proud of you guys <laughs> for having done all of this. And I think, um, I hope that families can see that these people care about your kids and that this is so hard and everyone is trying to do the best they can. And everyone wants your kids to be healthy and safe, and they want your kids to learn. And please know that we know this is not the best, right? We understand it's the best that we've got today. And I hope that people can give us grace and understanding as we move forward. I'm so thankful for the education guides that we got until September 8th so that all of our teachers can feel confident and prepared to go into a classroom. So just kudos to you guys. You've done an amazing job. <laughs> Ooh, while they're composing themselves. <laughs> you, you get a couple, but they, they, need, some. they need some too. <laughs> Thank you, Jardine. That means Are there any other questions from the board members in the room? Seeing none, Katrina, did you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share? I don't have any questions, but I agree with what Jerry said. Thank you. And yesterday, and that was the right words at the right time. Hey. <laughs> um, remote church has been a blessing in my mind. I've been able to continue to attend church without seeing all of my <laughs> church friends, except in Sunday school. I still have to avoid them in the Zoom. <laughs> all right. And, and any and, closing remarks from Dr. Wade? No, I think just, and then we're at 630. Yeah, as long as there's another, well, We'll continue to take the questions, the comments, the concerns, suggestions, whatever that helps us move this thing along. And, and if, it's, if it's anything we consider can consider, we will. If we can't, we'll tell people and tell them why. Great. Thank you. And um, as we transition now, we'll transition from our work session over to our regular board meeting. Um, Lisa and Stacy, before you sneak out, I do want to just say one more time, I won't make you come up here or anything. Y'all can stay back there. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for everything that you've been doing and for stepping forward and leading your peers 
I know that it's reassuring to them to um, see your calm and your excitement. Calm, calm, calm and excitement. You know, you know. I, I, Stacy, I know, I do know you. I know that calm is not really the right word, but but your lack of of apparent anxiety, your ability to come forward and say, we're going to be able to do this and we're going to step forward and we're going to lead each other and we're going to help each other and we're going to lean on each other and it's going to be okay. And, and everybody needs to hear that sometimes. And so just looking at the feedback that I saw from your peers over the last week after you guys did that training, um, it went a long way for them and for us and, um, we just have the best people in this school district, and you're two of them. Thank you. Okay. You can make everybody cry tonight. Thank you, guys. All right. On that note, we will move to the start of our official meeting, our regular meeting, and we will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, our first order of the night in our official meeting is special recognition of Kayla Simon. If she's here this evening, we would invite her to come in and join us. And if she is not here this evening, we do also have two. One chair has just been occupied. We have one free chair in the room that somebody could come in. <laughs> oh, now we're back to two. Okay. Is Kayla here this evening? No. All right. Well, Dr. Wade, will you read that recognition? Still oh, she is here. Awesome. All right. Our first special recognition is for Kayla Simon. Go ahead and stand. Congratulations to Ogden Elementary School fifth grade teacher Kayla Simon. She recently received the Outstanding Elementary School Teacher Award from the Kansas Society of Professional Engineers. The award recognizes teachers for helping to ensure a bright, successful future for all of the young minds who pass through her classroom. Congratulations again to Kayla Simon. We're proud of you. This is an opportunity for all of us to learn our nonverbal communication skills and practice them a little bit. Our next special recognition of the evening is for Sam Hankins, if he's here tonight. And he is not, but we'll still do his recognition. Congratulations to recent MHS graduate Sam Hankins. He was recently named the 2019-2020 Gatorade Kansas Boys Track and Field Athlete of the Year. The Gatorade State Player of the Year Award was established in 1985 to recognize the nation's most outstanding high school student athletes for their athletic excellence, academic achievement, and exemplary character. Ranked as the nation's number 12 recruit in the class of 2020 by mile split, Hankins launched Javelin a career best 224 feet 6 inches in 2019, which was the number one high school throw in the U.S. last spring. He has signed a national letter of intent to compete in track and field on scholarship at Texas A&M University. Congratulations again to Sam Hankins. We're proud of you. Okay, we next have the recognition of visitors and citizen comments. Um, now that we're back in person for our first in-person meeting, then uh, we would clearly go back to the ability for folks to come in and do in-person comments as long as we're here. But also citizens can submit written comments ahead of time that we will then read into the record. And this evening we do have a written comment from Angela Moore. She's a Lee, Lee Elementary teacher and she submitted written comments on behalf of the Lee Elementary staff regarding school cleanliness and maintenance. Um, the HVAC concerns and Diane Dennis and our board clerk will read that into the record. 
The staff at Lee Elementary feel it is imperative to bring the ongoing health and safety issues at our school to the attention of the Board of Education. We are deeply concerned for the safety of our students and our staff at this time. Many of the problems in our building have spanned years, several administrators, and remained unsolved by district maintenance. We have done as directed by our building principals and both reported the issues via maintenance request and by visual documentation, which was turned into administration. Still, the level of cleanliness and maintenance at our school remains unacceptable and unhealthy. Situations that were barely tolerable, such as our malfunctioning HVAC, which causes classroom temperatures above 80 degrees frequently, and mold to grow from the ceiling tiles, filthy floors, sinks, and bathrooms, are a health concern and a stress during a normal school year. During a pandemic, they are in inexcusable and a dangerous health hazard. Lee led the district elementary schools last year in influenza cases. We feel this is in part to the unsanitary conditions at our school. If our influenza rates are any in indicator, we do not feel optimistic about COVID-19. We share grave concerns about the safety of our indoor environment because of our dense population of students. Given the statistics on school HVAC systems shown, the statistics on HVAC systems show that 50% of schools have air quality issues and the Lee HVAC system is one that does not function properly. The recent statement by the WHO concerning the airborne nature of COVID, the WHO said, in a scientific brief that people who spend time in crowded settings with poor ventilation run the risk of being infected by the coronavirus as the droplets circulate throughout the air and in indoor gatherings. Along with other, specific, with other scientific reports citing the same, it causes cause us all to halt upon the thought of school resuming in our large school where HVAC does not function properly. If the virus is transmitted primarily via the air and the air does not circulate, viral loads will build up in classrooms. At Lee, we have 530 plus students and 60 plus staff. The bottom line is this, our school was not kept safe and healthy before COVID. So how can we feel safe returning to work in our building with increased risk of an airborne virus? These very real conditions exist at Lee, a dirty, unsanitary building, crowded classrooms, unventilated rooms, pairs and support staff who work in closets, and non-functioning HVAC. It would be disingenuous to assure the staff and public our building is safe if in fact, it is not. Science and HVAC standards must be used to assess buildings. The EPA instructed ASHRAE to prepare guidelines for schools. They issued these guidelines. We asked the district to investigate this matter thoroughly and transparently and look into what can be done as it is a matter of educator safety, the safety of children, public health, outbreaks in schools will rapidly affect the public, and due diligence in terms of the science of how the disease spreads. Specific concerns. Our buildings got a new HVAC when the building was added onto. It has not worked correctly since then. Some rooms have AC, some seem to have none. Some rooms are burning hot in the winter, some get very little heat. Numerous teachers and admin have turned in trouble tickets, had conversations, pleaded with everyone to help fix both the general building dirtiness and the HVAC issue. Every fall, temperatures are recorded inside classrooms above 80 degrees and as much as 98 degrees. Many avenues have been tried, our own maintenance crew, other area HVAC folks, etc. 
and still the problems persist. Teachers are frustrated and feel this is being swept under the rug yet again, and we cannot have this happen with our lives on the line. This issue of our HVAC was on the bond proposal poster they hung at our school to persuade people to vote yes on the bond. If they knew there wasn't enough money for it then, they should have never put it on the poster. Principals that have shared information about problems with our Lee HVAC, Nancy Cole, Mindy Sanders, and Erica Baumas. We are voicing our concerns yet again, as this can be dangerous because of the spread of the COVID-19 virus. We appreciate your time and consideration of the lives and safety of our students and staff. Sincerely, the staff of Lee Elementary School. Thank you. For our consent agenda, we have the July 1st minutes, the consideration of bills, the financial reports for June 2020, the clerk's report, the treasurer's report, and the activities report. For our human resources report, we have the recognition of Kim Abernathy, who's a crossing guard at Lee Elementary. She has submitted her retirement effective July 1 of 2020. Ms. Abernathy has been with the district since September of 2011. And we certainly appreciate her service. For donations and grants, we have a $500 cash donation from the Caroline Pine Charitable Foundation to Amanda Arnold, Lumont, Amanda Arnold, Lumont, Frank Bergman, Theodore Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson Elementary Schools for consumable. A plus stream supplies, equipment, student technology, or other creative resources for a total this time of $500. Um, Mr. Dorst, will you go ahead and come on up while I finish reading this here? We have the Early Learning Program Federal Report, the Early Learning Program Employee Handbook, the Early Learning Program Student Handbook, the Manhattan High School Handbook, Revised Board Policy CF Board, Superintendent Relations, the Revised Board Policy DFE Investment of Funds, Revised Board Policy GAAD Child Abuse, and Revised Board Policy HAE Board Negotiating Representatives. And before we would ask for a motion to, for that approval of the consent agenda, there were a few questions um, about the Manhattan High School handbook changes, which is why I invited Mr. Dorse to join us. And then if he could kind of speak to those questions, we could then decide whether we want to um, have a motion to keep it on and, and move to approve the consent agenda as it is, or if we wanted to take that off and take that up separately. Um, so Mr. Dorst, I contacted you and uh, Kristen, I think contacted you as well, just with a few questions um, things to highlight, one would be the change to the headwear, and then also some questions about uh, phones, uh, photos, and videos. Uh, the first one that comes up is on page 145 on the appearance. We, um, we really tackled this, and um, the reason that the, the Manhattan High School Student Handbook's coming to the board in July is there just isn't time for the admin team to get together and tackle it. And it's a, it's a, it's a big one this year. It's, there's quite a bit of changes. And so the, the team agreed, I appreciate the board allowing us to do that. And it allowed us to meet, just talk about what we wanted. And um, it's interesting, I, I emailed uh, President Hagermeister um, when you brought that up the day because I was walk, uh, talking with um, the CDI committee and and mentioned that we wanted to go forward with something very similar and um so the the one of the biggest changes in the in the policy and we took parts of it and, and reworked it but beginning at the uh 20 beginning in the 2021 school year headwear will be allowed headwear must follow the appearance guidelines of mhs and the board dress uh, board of education dress code policy jcdb which um the dress code policy jcdb is, is the opening uh, statement in the appearance guidelines. And um, we, we believe that this increases the amount of positive interaction 
and decreases the amount of just negative interaction, the amount of time that we're asking students to to take headwear off or remove headwear or working with them. Um, and uh, we feel that we're going to see a, a, a large impact on the ability to to um, just be more positive in students' lives when they come to Manhattan High School. I did take a Thank call you. from a community member today on it too. I did as well. Good. Yes, there was one citizen comment that contacted me that was a bit concerned about that. Uh -huh. so. And in the uh, conversation, he appreciated our, uh, our uh, energy and uh, focus. So it, was, it was, ended up positive. Okay, we're ready for the next one. Um, I have to say, I, in tackling this, going through the amount of uh, different policies that we had, um, I have to thank Mrs. Clark, um, the uh, office professional for, for Manhattan High School, and, and she was really helping to uh, comb through and looking, making sure that we have the most up-to-date board policy. So the electronic device, and we titled it cell phone because that's primary, the primary device that, that students use. Um, it, we were pulling from the past policy, reorganizing it, past, you bring your own device policies. And one thing I did um, miss was the one that was approved a year and a half ago on three of 2019. Um, it still says a couple things that I think um, there was concern about, about the um, currently uh, recording of audiovisual made in violation of the board um, board policy or school rules are the sole property of USD 33 and may be used only with permission of the superintendent of the district. So there are things that are that are that are present in our current uh, bring your own device or um, current uh, Manhattan Ogden information technology IT basics, and um, so uh, trying to pull a, a ton of information and let it be usable for our students in a student handbook. Uh, we believe that off of that same um, information, there is a statement on number nine that we would like to change. Change from the student may not use the device to record, transmit, or post photos, audio, or video while at school. Any recordings or photos made at school are the property of Manhattan Ogden USD 33 and Manhattan Ogden USD 33 has complete control over the use of such recordings or photographs. I'd like to change that to what it says in Technology Code of Conduct, which was revised on March of 20. Any recordings or photographs made at school or school related property or in uh, connection with the school sponsored event may become the property of Manhattan Ogden, USD 333, may, may become the property. If a student transmits or posts content in violation of the board policies, administrative procedures, or school rules, it is understood that you, uh, Manhattan Ogden, USD 333, has uh, discretion over the use of such recordings and, and photographs. I think that that would be a, a suitable change. Okay. So the concern that, that I had heard back was so if I'm at the high school, I'm a high school student and I'm hanging out with my friend Jardine in the commons and we take a picture, is that now the school's pro property? And the first reading of that, I think that would be a reasonable interpretation. And I don't know that that's what we were really going for or what you were going for at that point. I think the main concern was that if there was behavior or photographs or videos that were criminal or mm -hmm. inappropriate in nature that the district would have some ability to pull that information back and address it accordingly. So I appreciate the work that the um, technology team has done this year because I think that the language in that number nine from the technology policy um, is consistent with, with I think the intent originally in the first place, plus then it's just consistent technology policy is the same as the high school policy. So did anybody else have any, Daryl, did you have any? Well, if I remember right, Kurt, you were here. The reason that was put in was there was a legal issue that came up and a videoing of that issue that transpired. Um, and I think that is why 
the whole piece was put in there. And I'm not sure that because of that, we shouldn't send it or make sure it's worded correctly according to uh, the guys at KSB, the attorneys up there. I think it fits in because we ran that through with the um, tech language. Tech okay, and that's fine. Then. I just want to make sure that, yeah, you know, because I, of that one legal issue that I remember happening that we, it's been several years ago. I can't tell you all the, and I wouldn't anyway. And can I compliment <laughs> my team? But we deal with that issue probably all the time <laughs> once a week it's a, it rarely does it does it work its way up but it is and i think my my one sentence reply was um is that the reason we wanted to update cell phone electronic devices is based is because of unauthorized filming of individuals in our building reported by students sometimes reported by adults sometimes we just want to be able to have something that we can fall back on and say you know that was that breaks policy you how you were recording breaks other policies and you're using that device to break policies and we want to have that access if it does right and we want to be able to tell the student don't do that okay. Kristen, number one i just want to make sure i'm clear because there are two definite issues here and i can see the mentor students all freaked out as well as it, someone who went to journalism school about ownership that's one whole issue mm -hmm. we also are going to have a lot of teachers probably videoing in their classrooms so we've got intellectual property issues probably at stake then there's the issue of is it just against school policy to post something to Instagram at school? Because that's that's the way I read this bullet. And that's what my, Mr. Dorst just described as changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, I guess I feel like I need to read it or see it all before we just approve it. So do we wanna pull it off of the consent agenda for tonight? And Mr. Dorst, mm -hmm. can you send forward the new, yes. that proposed change to language? And then we can bring it back at our next meeting if we don't have a start date. We've got a little more time, yeah, so we have a little time <laughs> to do that's that. That's probably a little more okay after three, three o'clock. Yeah, if that's okay, Kurt. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, I think I honor Kristen's feelings. I, I didn't even notice that, but I guess. But what what was the the opposition of the headwear thing, or what was the problem with the headwear? The CDI talked brought that to you, I believe, because that was part of our one of our discussions. What was the opposition or problem with the the headwear? Tradition. Just the 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 social norms of what one person may have well, been well, used to. Well, over I understand years. what it means, but what board? I mean, a question it, came from from a board member about no, it. No, no, no. Oh. It was a citizen comment. Oh, okay. It was a citizen phone call. Oh, okay. All right, I just wondered. Okay, I didn't know yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 Okay, so if we wouldn't mind a motion that would do that, Jardine, go for it. So I move to accept the consent agenda with the exception of the MHS handbook being removed. Second. Kurt will second and we'll call the vote. If you're here, if you'd raise a hand if you approve. All right, and Katrina? Yes. Okay, motion carries 7-0. And Mr. Dorse, we'll just look for that on the next, when you get it ready for us, send it back through. Thank you for coming up and Thank answering you. those questions for us and working on that in the midst of everything else. Okay, we have spoken reports now. And that calls us to Tricia with the construction update, who I believe is waiting in the wings. Okay. Tricia's out there somewhere? Yeah. I got you. Sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> At all. I know, I gotta find my thing first. Sorry. I wasn't You being my banner again. Okay. 
so as we have the board report, um, we'll go through it. Next, next slide. So Eugene Field, College Hill, um, I will tell you uh, first and foremost, Eugene Field, um, Clint just sent me five options on Eugene Field. So he's been working very hard trying to come out with a layout um, that I think that he's happy with, I'm happy with, you guys would be happy with, but also stays within the budget. Um, trying to extend, you know, when we showed you the option of the L-shaped, it just doesn't fit in our uh, into our budget. So I've really had him working on comments that Elizabeth has made and her team have made, plus the comments that I've taken, plus um, what Eric has said, uh, to go back and really look at um, how can we make this fit? So he's come up with five options and um, he, there's, and I'll, I'll bring them to you guys, but he, he really likes number four and one. And I really like number five that he sent me. So it adds an element of creativity that I like and it allows for um, two parking lots and a pretty good size um, playground on the North side of the building. So, um, I'm going to get with him tomorrow and kind of go over those things, but that's kind of the update that happened after I had done uh, my report. So College Hill, um, lots is happening at College Hill. I can't praise Josh, the superintendent over there. He makes things happen um, before they need to happen. So uh, the West Wing has all their first coats of paint on it, um, with the exception of in the hallway and in the kitchen. Um, all ceiling grid is up, again, his exception of uh, corridors and in the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen did pass its uh, in-wall inspections, so the insulators will be there um, either later this week or next week to get the insulation put into the walls before the drywall gets put up. Uh, deliveries that they've gotten are lights, wiring doors, um, duct work, and the special light doors, which is in frames. It's a special door that doesn't swell in the heat, um, so those will be on the um, south side and the west side of the door, or west side of the building. Um, and they're to ship this week. Permanent power is hooked up. Uh, kind of an interesting thing happened today. They had power outage in that neighborhood and the temp power went out, but the permanent power didn't go out, but everybody else in the neighborhood didn't have power. So, but uh, the permanent part of the building had power. So, um, it was done well. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. So I was like, well, at least you're up. Um, half the build or about a quarter of the building has lights lit up um, and are running. So by the end of the week, they should half the building should be up and running. Um, there's eight roofers working on the job right now, putting the cap sheets on the roof. Um, metal siding guys have almost made it all the way around to the storm shelter. It looks really good. Uh, technology contractor that the district hired Parsons has gotten half of the building wired up, which is be the west half. Um, they're almost done with a rough end of the old school part. I was in there this morning and um, thank God it smelled like wood and not old, mildy, you know, musty smell. So that was nice. They've got all the subfloor put down. Um, they need to do that in order to put the new flooring down. Um, they'll start sealing grid on the east side next week and they'll start polished concrete um, in a couple weeks. And they should have permanent air by the middle of August, if not sooner. Um, they need to have that air so they can start the epoxy uh, floors. And then they'll start storm pipe work next week. So um, kind of an interesting thing. I'll let you go to the next slide. Um, there's just some views of the um, ladder that goes up to the roof, um, some wiring um, happening, some electrical panels. Matt, I'm sure, is excited about that one. Um, the, the bottom middle is the reception area, so that's where it's all uh, sheetrocked in, and then some corridors, and then the bottom um, bottom right is the roof. It's kind of the sheet, what the roof looks like. Inside you'll see the grid and the lights. Uh, the green tag is that um, Josh was approved for the uh, permanent power, so was, he was pretty proud about that. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to show you that. Um, there's metal panels that will be above each of the skylight areas, so that's a, kind of a neat feature. Uh, the middle one you can't see very well, but um, it, the blue paint is on the wall, and it does show how the, the um, ceiling um, starts up high and it goes down low. Um, when I was in there today, it's very deceiving. You, know, you guys have all walked this and you've seen how the, the rooms are very square. The walls are straight, but you walk in there now with the ceiling grid in and with the paint on the wall, it's very deceiving and it looks like it has an angle to it. 
And I'm like, so I looked at Josh and I'm like, did this room change? And he's like, no. And I'm like, it looks like it all triangles in here. And he goes, it's not. And I said, it's a huge deception when you walk in now when you see it. So it's kind of cool though. And it's really neat. It, and it only happens when the light comes on. When the lights aren't on, it doesn't do that. But when the lights come on, it's a, a really interesting deception that happens in there. So I'm not sure Clint meant that, but maybe he did. Next one. Keith Knoll, uh, it's still ongoing. We're not uh, closed out on that. They did the most strip. They poured it in our patio, which is to the north of the building. That's where the uh, Keith Knoll Memorial tree will be planted around that. We'll have either um, a park bench or a table out there. Um, and that's also kind of where they're going to put the um, bus um, pickup is going to be close to that area. Um, civil folks did their punch list um, earlier this week. Uh, the replacement roof panels will be here on the 24th next Friday, and then Carly will be here then the Monday after that to replace our roof. Uh, partial delivery for the furniture will happen Monday and Tuesday next week. Um, unfortunately, they've had some delays with some uh, materials for the furniture that goes in the offices, and those are kind of the um, custom-made pieces. They're not custom-made, but they are made to fit the offices. So, so it's still ongoing, but hopefully we'll get it done by... Uh, the middle of August. So moving on. Um, Oliver Brown, I continue to work basically on the same thing. Uh, masonry walls, um, footings. Um, they are starting to swing some steel in area A. So area A is the furthest to the north, then B, and then C um, as we progress towards the south on the building. Um, they're hoping to start some duct work in the next couple weeks. Um, and then roofing on the gym has slipped back, unfortunately, a couple weeks, but that may work into their favor as they start swinging steel. They might be able to hit the hit the gym and hit area A and then just keep on working down the line. So uh, brickwork should begin in a couple weeks. Um, they need to get the brick up and do their finish their mock-up wall, which will be done by the end of the week so they can um, approve that. They do have temporary power out there, so no more generators. So they're excited about that. So moving on. Just some more uh, pictures so with the masonry walls. A lot of masons, a lot of masonry walls out there, a lot of concrete out there. So, and you can tell in both the two upper corner pictures, that's the protective coating for anywhere that there's polished concrete. That's the protective coating that they're putting down on the floor so that it doesn't get messed up. And the next. Eisenhower and Anthony, um, these projects are cruising right along. Um, both the schools, uh, heat pump deliveries, all the heat pumps have been delivered to date. Um, so the installation is ongoing task at both the schools. By the end of the week, EMS should have, a, have up all their heat pumps, and hopefully AMS should have them all up by the end of next week. Um, both mechanical and electrical contractors are working in the mechanical room renovations. Um, it's quite an amazing feat that they've, um, all the stuff that came out and that what little stuff is going in, but still have the same power and they have all the stuff that's going on in the mechanical rooms. Doors have been hung in the renovated spaces. Uh, ceiling grid is going to be an ongoing thing everywhere in the buildings, so it's going to be an ongoing process as the heat pumps get done, they get hooked up, the ductwork gets done. Ceiling grid will go up and then ceilings will go back in. Uh, they've both been working on the footings for the precast panels. Precast panels will be here in the mid-August. They will start at Anthony. They'll get those precast panels set and tabbed, and then they'll move over to Eisenhower and finish those precast panels. Some of the brickwork has been done at um, Eisenhower. The brickwork that um, faces into the courtyard has been done. It looks really nice. Unfortunately, Anthony's brickwork won't be here. T or brick will not be here till the end of the month. Um, it is a different color, so it's uh, unfortunately it's taken a little bit longer. Starting next week, you'll see some uh, carpet go down at both of the schools, which is really good. Um, casework did get done at Anthony. Casework was getting done at um, Eisenhower today, and it looks really, really nice. Uh, painters are working on the main hallways at both of the front schools. That was a change order that we decided to do to make those uh, main entries from like doorway to doorways to the doors um, to be all one color and so it doesn't look spotty and patchy, so it's all one color. And lights are being hooked up and running at AMS, and they're working on those at EMS. If you'll slide forward. So here's some pictures of Anthony, um, just exterior pictures of some bearing walls, some masonry. Um, I took those today so you can tell it rained and that there was nobody on site this afternoon. So next one. So here's some exciting pictures of the interior. 
So the top left is the um, counter space that is going to be the new reception area that is about 40 feet long. It is one huge um, reception desk. So um, <laughs> it's a lot. So um, the middle picture in the bottom, that is the piece that is the front piece of that counter. So it's got purple in the back, and then there's this really cool um, kind of a glass metal piece that goes in front of it. So obviously it, Eisenhower will be green. Um, and then just some other pictures of casework. Um, the bottom right to the purple, that is in the nurses area. And then there's the other pictures are of the library. So you can kind of see that the ceiling is going to have some dimensional um, heights to it. Some pieces are going to be higher. Some other pieces are going to be lower. The piece to the far, the picture to the far top right, that is the clouds that are above where the um, circulation desk is going to be and just outside the librarian's office. So next one. At Eisenhower, here's some pictures of the exterior. So they're kind of all about in the same place as far as masonry go. And they are sharing the same mason. So he's going back and forth and has um, crews working on both sides. We'll go to that next one. And some of the interior pictures as well. Pizza box toilet lid. Pizza box toilet lid, that's right. <laughs> Stay out of it. <laughs> so that's one of the new bathrooms actually um, that we've created into the workspaces. Um, at both wings, they have those work areas for the teachers, so those, they now have two um, ADA restrooms and can be accessible. Moving on. Lee Elementary, hopefully you all have driven by there. There's lots happening, all the demos complete. Um, unfortunately, we're having a, quite a time keeping somebody from quit turning the water on at the soccer field. Um, we can't get our post set for the fence that goes on top of that retaining wall. So. Um, Erica's being really good and she's going to work with um, Master Landscapes and just get the water turned off so we can get that area to dry out. Otherwise, we can't get our posts set. Um, concrete paving's begun. If you've driven by there, they've got a lot of paving done. Um, and we are going to be, um, Erica has some capital outlay money, so we are going to do a shade weather structure. It's going to be about 20 feet long and it's about 8 feet wide. And it's going to go on the very end of where the parent pickup drop-off is, um, so she's, um, that was part of what she wanted to do with some of her capital money. Let's go forward. Um, first couple top pictures are all of the bus lane, so hopefully Andrea is going to be really happy that she has a bus lane. It's a very nice paved area um, for the buses to park on. And the rest of the pictures are just basically just showing you the paving of the parking lot, and I think it's going to be a very nice addition for those folks. I'm going to work with Erica um, and BHS to come up with some signage to help say, hey, parents, here's where you go, here's how you park, here's how you drive through the parking lot, and off you go. So we'll go to the next one. You can see the retaining wall in the back on the right. You get a chance that retaining wall would look really cool. It does. At Bergman, lots of things are happening. There's a lot of exciting things happening. So they've done all their dirt work. Um, they're working from the east to the west because that's how the progression needs to happen on those parking lots. The sanitary line is complete. Now they're working on the stormwater line. Unfortunately, it was too wet today for them to do a whole lot out there. The electricians are going to come in and start setting the light poles, and then they're going to trench for the power back to the building. Uh, they originally weren't going to do all the light poles, uh, the bases. Um, that was going to be done in the second phase, but I'm like, eh, now we need to do it in this phase because if we're going to be parking, not only in the east parking lot, but if we get that section of the middle parking lot, then we need to have lights. So uh, we decided it was a better option to go ahead and get that done now. Um, and then they're going to start working on the north side of the building, the vestibule. That should be done by the time school starts. Um, it'll be a secured vestibule. We have the AFO moved over there. We've got a security, a badge access over there. Um, so that will stay permanently there. We're not going to move it. It'll just be a permanent feature um, to stay in the building um, once it's done. Here's some pictures just kind of showing you it's been cleaned out, um, the grading's done. Um, they've taken out quite a bit of grading up against the building as well. Um, we did meet with Steve out there this morning, uh, BHS and I. We are trying, we're coming up with some signage as well out there to talk about here's where you're going to drop your student off. You're going to stage here. You'll be called forward. Just trying to get people to learn how they need to park around that building um, and just stay away, stay away from the buses. You'll go forward. Uh, Manhattan High School, we're having our first kickoff. We're having our kickoff meeting on uh, Monday. 
uh, via Zoom. And as it stands right now, the project was supposed to start on the 27th, but I just got word uh, this afternoon that um, fencing will start on the 23rd. There's a lot of fencing that's got to go up over there on that west side. So they are going to start on the 23rd. Um, next week, we on Tuesday morning, I have a 930 meeting with the city. We got to talk about what trees are going to stay and what trees are going to be removed as we uh, we have a construction entrance that's going to come off of their service entrance over by the zoo. So we've got to talk about what we need to do to clear out the path and um, clear our way to in order to get to the south side of our property. So uh, things are starting to move along with that. And then Marlette, um, we did send, I got a new kitchen layout. So I've sent that to Stephanie and to Sheila to look at, um, look over and wait to get feedback on that. The warehouse, um, Jamie and I have a Zoom meeting with Gould Evans to see what they've laid out for us um, for the warehouse. So we look forward to that. And questions, anybody? We get Somebody. Are you excited to have three extra weeks possibly come up today? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't want to give them any extra time. But I do have one other thing I do need to tell you. Since you just said say, um, if if you haven't seen, if you haven't heard, um, Union Two, which is HVAC sheet metal workers, is on strike in this town. Um, I would have never thought this would happen, but it is happening in this town. Is it affecting us? Yes, it is affecting us. It is happening at Anthony um, because U.S. Engineering is part of that union. Um, so their sheet metal workers are on strike. They've been on strike for two weeks now, um, and there is no end in sight, unfortunately, uh, for that union. So McCown Gordon has been working very diligently and very hard to come up with solutions. So they have hired a company out of Kansas City, Tempcon, has brought in um, six guys to come in and help with that sheet metal. Um, so they're working. They started working yesterday, and they were there today. And I thank them very kindly for coming in and helping us. Um, Central Mechanical also has some extra workers. Um, somehow they're not part of it. I don't get it, but. Um, they're still working at Eisenhower, but they've, they're also going to send five guys over to help us. Um, this could delay the project, but I don't know the severity of it right now. But um, the plumbers do the heat pumps, the electricians do another part, but the actual sheet metal that hooks up to the heat pumps, the straps that go around, the sheet metal screws have to be done by sheet metal workers. So... Um, that's what's happening. They, you will see that they are picketing at um, NBAF and at U.S. Engineering's office. So there are um, pickets going on. If you do come by Anthony, you will see a two-gate system um, at the parking lot. So the gate to the east is locked, and the gate to the west is the gate that we have to use. So if they were ever to come over and to picket our job, then they would use the locked gate as their picket site. So that is what's going on there. Any questions about that? Picketing. I, I think you're right. Our timeline will help the middle schools. Yeah. So it's right. we, like it would have been tight. <laughs> we were going to be really tight at the middle was. schools. So it was going to be very, um, at both sites, it's going to be very tight. Mm -hmm. we, um, it looks like a war zone at Anthony right now, and but it looks like a war zone over at EMS as well. Um, the heat pumps are a lot. Um, hooking up the heat pumps are a lot. Getting controls right is a lot. So um, it's going to be very tight. And our timeline was August 5th, and it was going to push it right up to August 5th, literally. But I'm not going to give them slack. So yeah. I don't have time to give them slack. It'll help us on the punch list, honestly. It'll help us down on the punch list. And I'm not trying to do punch lists while there are kids in the building. Um, so, but yeah. Good. Okay. That's it. I don't see any others here. Katrina, did you have any questions? I didn't. Thank you for that overview. Great. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you so much. Dr. Wade. Okay. We all know that we've got, got great staff, strong leaders in our district, and uh, some of them are especially humble and uh, are rec they're recognized as leaders outside of our district and a couple of individuals in the room came to my attention 
never said a word about this. Here we're in the 2020, 2021 school year. And I find out that Matt Davis was the 2019, 2020 president of Kansas Association of Directors of Plant Facilities. <laughs> and Michelle Jones is 2019, 2020 president of the Kansas School Public Relations Association. So you may never see that or hear it any place else, but I wanted to let them know somebody somewhere, you know, let us know that they're leaders throughout the state. Yeah. <laughs> Also would like uh, Michael Dorse to come up again. He, he's getting up to the mic quite a bit today, but I wanted him to talk a little bit about the commencement ceremony because that was something earlier in the year we said, after we saw the plan and from the state, announcement needs to be made about, about commencement ceremony. So he did some send something out today and I'd like him to talk about it. Uh, sent something out via messenger and we posted it on our um, uh, Twitter uh, Twitter link and also on Facebook and it was a message to the um, Manhattan High School 2020 graduates and parents and we had planned for our commencement to take place on Sunday uh, August 2nd at 7 p.m. at Bishop Stadium uh, we continue to be in communication with Riley County Department of Health um, about you know our size limit of, of events and then also we have continued to reach out to K-State, our contacts at K-State to see if K-State facilities uh, were an option. I think it's good to mention at K-State, they, uh, they have canceled their convocation, uh, in-person convocation with their kids. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, to, to ask and to even uh, imagine that they would cancel an event like that and then you know, invite us on. Um, also, they don't, they're limited on their staff, especially on August 2nd. Um, so we have two options that we're going to put forth that they could take, our graduates can take advantage of, of um, either one, both, or none. But uh, one of the options is on that same day on August 2nd, because we know a lot of um, family get-togethers have been planned around that date, that uh, we're going to set up an area in our uh, northeast courtyard right by Sunset parking lot because we can control that, uh, the traffic flow in and out of that area and um, have an opportunity for them, uh, for our graduates to come up, receive their diploma covers, and uh, take a picture. Um, we're gonna have it set up for, for that. It's something that we've seen other schools, I, I know um, Emporia has done it, have been in, in communication with their principal, and they had a good turnout with that. Um, we'll also have somebody there to take a picture of the, the graduate by flags, something similar that, that um, the graduates have, have received in the past. And then also um, Sunday, May 9th of 2021 is our uh, 2 p.m. at Bramlage Coliseum is the graduation or commencement ceremony for um, the, the graduating class of 2021. We're prepared to um, welcome, invite, and recognize our 2020 uh, graduates also during that time. So um, there's information about making sure they can stay in contact with Mrs. Walters by a certain date. We don't want them to uh, commit now to that because things can change. But by um, April 1st, we want them to, to have their commitment if, if they're going to do that. So we can begin to plan around that. Um, but we're going to be working with our graduates. We're also uh, was in communication. I had to leave a message with Alan Zhang, uh, but was uh, spoke with Will Bannister. Uh, those are our two commencement speakers. They both uh, understood. Uh, they were almost, it seemed like they were expecting the phone call. Um, and they they understand um, why we can't proceed uh, because we're, I mean, limited to uh, mass gathering size of 50. Um, the way we averaged it right now with the feedback that we received, if, um, if we just limited it to two people for visitors per graduate, you know, we're teetering around um, 1,500 to 2,000 people, you know, because you're not going to just limit it to two people, you know, sometime maybe three or four. So um, if we're if we're looking at a, a mass gathering of 1,500 people and you say, well, just divide that up into manageable groups of 50, you know, um, that's 40 cer ceremonies. 
So I just, you know, just doing the, the, the logistics and the math on that, um, I, you know, you begin to understand why it, um, why it would be difficult. And our, our, um, I say all that, and um, our, our, our graduates are still worth it. You know, so we're, we're trying to figure out what the best thing to do would be. Um, it just, you know, can we fit 40 hours of ceremonies in? And I don't think we just can't. And that's the hard call that we had to make. Um, so, um, but the two options that we have, I think, um, are good options. And uh, we'll continue to work with Will and Alan. And we'll have that. Um, I'll have a section of a video that we'll put together uh, recognizing and certifying that the Class of 2020 have met the graduation requirements for the Board of Education. Thank you. Do you have any, any questions for Mr. Dorst? I know it's not an easy decision. And thank you. And you've de definitely demonstrated to them that you wanted to do this, that, you know, that everybody ought to be able to see that, that you've done what you can to be able to recognize them in a couple different ways. So thank you for that. And I think it's good. I and mean, we had a, a map, a plan for Bishop. You know, we knew where graduates were going to come. We knew we weren't going to run a rehearsal because you can't, you know, that would just be increasing uh, contact. Had the, the, the stands that Bishop divided out, figure out how to do that. When you start talking about bottleneck of people coming into Bishop, the close contact that they would be, it, it just, and, and our, our, when we met with Julie Gibbs, it's just something that we, there's there no plan that would, that would be acceptable to our current condition. I think Eric's got a, an update for us on, on CARES money tied to COVID. Yeah, I had a meeting today with uh, Riley County and some other schools within the, within the county about uh, county's CARES money, which is also known as SPARKS money. So if you hear anything about SPARKS money, Schools are one of the eligible entities for that. So we kind of went over a meeting of what was an eligible expense um, under the Sparks. So I think there's a, a likelihood that we could put in now our guarantee of getting it and how much really depends on how much is out there and how much is available and how much everybody needs and how we spread that out. But I think a lot of the um, PP&E purchases we've had so far um, can be an eligible expense for us. Some of the technology purchases, some of the extra time. You know, when we talked about Lisa Julian, Stacy Harris, training staff, bringing them in for three days, bringing other staff in for Canvas training. Some of that is that we're doing that out of response for COVID and anticipation of, you know, at home learning in, in some capacity. So that could be tagged to a COVID expense. Um, so some of the extra things that we're doing to combat, and like I said, the PP&E, the mass, um, we, we put in an order for 14,500 masks, you know, uh, this week, cause we want to provide two masks for every student and staff member that we have. We, we wanted to avoid that process of, I, I don't have a mask or I can't take care of that. So we want to provide that, um, we want to do that, but that, that could be something that could be a reimbursable for us down the line, as well as some of the like plexiglass Matt was talking about, the hand sanitizer, the, the wipes. You know, when I put in my first order of mass order of disposable wipes, you know, I think when Jamie told me how much they cost, I about fell out of my chair. They're, they're crazy expensive and Sparks money um, can be anticipated. We can take what we've already spent and put in for that, but we can also anticipate what we would spend out through the month of December is eligible for Sparks money. So we've got a lot of options. We'll continue to work with the county on getting them that information. So I just want to let you know we've, we, we've got our hat in the ring as far as county Sparks money. And as we continue to keep busy with construction and reopening and everything else, we, we still recognize there's going to be a lot of mental health needs out there, still planning for that, working, moving forward. And, and like Andrea Tidi, just to give an update on the, the mental health intervention team, school mental health, whatever, the, the, the two big mental health areas we have. Please tell them I about. studied <laughs> so I could define each of these and sound incredibly intelligent. So I don't know if you remember, but we've had two si simultaneous grants and programs running this year. The first one is our mental health intervention team, 
which was a partnership between our district and Pawnee. And the goal was to have a mental health liaison that could help connect our students and families with services through the mental health um, center. And then on top of that, we were also doing our um, school mental health initiative and it all really paired together very nicely. And I'm grateful that we had both running at the same time and probably didn't realize how beneficial it was to work together until you evaluate like all the things that we get to do because we're working together on both of these grants. So we were afforded the opportunity to expand into year two on both initiatives. So approved for additional funding um, through the mental health intervention team and we will be adding an additional mental health liaison. So Sam Brown is our current liaison and we'll add an additional one hopefully soon. Um, and then we'll also continue our school mental health initiative with through TASN. So great things happening for kids and families and supporting teachers and schools. So we look forward to that opportunity. So I wanted to let you know that that hasn't gone by the wayside by any means as, as we talk about other things. That, that concludes the superintendent's report unless there's questions. Any questions for Dr. Wade, Katrina? I don't. Thank you so much, Dr. Wade. Good. Thank you. All right. Ashley, if you want to come on in. We've got our NEA Manhattan Ogden report tonight and some other folks that are going to be coming in as well. Come on in. Thank you guys so much. You're definitely going to want to make sure you turn on your mic and pull it up close. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> this is fun. How's everyone doing? <laughs> All right. So just some updates really quick. Sorry, Aaron like really tries to keep me on point and maybe next year. Um, we got negotiations still going on. We'll do, we working on that tomorrow. Um, looking at the new year, everyone, Everyone's just kind of trying to play whack-a-mole and, and get things as organized as we can. Um, benefits enrollment, of course, is July 27 through 31st. And as of right now, new educator luncheon and ice cream social is for July 31st. Um, the labor task force has been meeting with Eric throughout, kind of going over options in the reopening plan and um, communicating some of the teacher concerns and feelings as we go. Right now we're focusing on certified staff concerns. Um, we do have an email set up that teachers have been emailing. We're reading them. We're trying to reply to them. We understand that everybody has strong emotions right now. And so we appreciate the feedback and we appreciate everyone's teamwork throughout this process and trying to set up a plan that's going to be most beneficial for everyone. So just thank you for that partnership. Um, members on that team from the teachers are Aaron Meyer Gambrell, myself, Cindy Norris, Carrie Andrade, Jackie Kirkaby, Lisa Heller, and Lisa Julian. So they've put in a lot of time extra <laughs> this, this summer, and we do really appreciate everything that they've been doing. So with all the craziness, let's just all kind of sit back take a deep breath <laughs> and realize that regardless of what this year looks like, um, we have fantastic educators in our district who are here and willing to serve whatever that may look like. So we have several Celebrating What's Right teachers tonight um, since we're in person. The first one is going to be Andrea Fields. Come on up, Andrea. Andrea is a fourth grade teacher at Woodrow Wilson. She has been teaching in USD 383 since 1988. Some of her um, roles has been a lead teacher for the extended day learning, and she has supervised 11 KSU pre-service teachers. Something that stood out that Andrea shared was, um, and I'm just gonna read kind of what she submitted. As a teacher, it is important to be current in the best instructional methods and techniques, but it's equally important to see each student as a unique individual. I need to learn what motivates, encourages, and discourages each student. I cannot know a student until I create a safe place for that student to learn and grow. My classroom, may need, my classroom needs to be a place where students feel safe physically, mentally, and emotionally. 
It needs to be a place where everyone is encouraged to take risk and make mistakes without, sorry guys, I ran over my phone, fearing ridicule. Questions can be asked, hypotheses can be tested, and creativity can be encouraged. So, Andrea Fields. Um, <laughs> I did tell them that they could share anything if they wanted, or if you guys have questions, feel free. Any? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Andrea. You. Callista Speak is next. She's not unable to be here this evening, but we still feel that she deserves some recognition. She is a kindergarten teacher at Amanda Arnold and has been in our district since 2015. Some of the roles that she has had in our district include science lead, building leadership team, um, summer camp teacher at the Power Panther Club, student improvement team coordinator, and a mentor teacher. Something that she wrote that stood out was, teaching is a profession that is always changing. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Sorry. Every year, new strategies are being introduced or reintegrated into schools. Teachers should be continuously learning and always striving to learn and implement the best strategies to help students learn and student growth. Teaching goes above and beyond the classroom, which makes teaching not an easy profession. It takes a lot of heart, patience, teamwork, and love to be an effective teacher. Effective teaching is being prepared for all students who walk into the classroom and using multiple learning strategies to reach all learners. So that is um, Calista, if you happen to see her around. Um, okay, and I apologize, I am going to mess up her name, and I already told her I owe her cookies for it. Um, we have Menon Riffet. She's a second grade teacher. She's unable to be with us tonight. Um, she is a second grade teacher at Woodrow Wilson. She has been in our district since 2009. Some of her roles include being um, the building social committee, Internal Communications Committee member, Building Leadership Team, MTSS Grade Level Representative, Teacher Representative for the Site Council, um, Teacher Representative for the PTO, and Professional Development Committee member. A little bit about her philosophy. My philosophy has ebbed and flowed over the past 15 years. It has evoked with, it has evolved with the changing needs of students. My philosophy is now simple. Relationships are key. Know your students and let your students know you. Let them know you care. Let them know they mean something to you. So she is another fantastic teacher. All right, Linda Duckworth is here tonight. Guys, reading is hard after a summer off. Okay, Linda is a third grade teacher at Northview. She has been in the district since 1993. Some of her roles have included social committee chairman, social studies lead teacher, building leadership team for MTSS, PDC lead teacher, and TLC representative. Something that stood out that she submitted was, the structure of education is built around the relationships we form with our students. Every child comes to school with a unique set of circumstances. As teachers, we must meet the student where they are academically, emotionally, and behaviorally. We must create a safe and caring learning environment where students feel empowered to learn. If a teacher is able to build trust, they are going to be able to encourage their students to take risk as well as ownership in their educational journey. From that, the students will gain confidence, enabling them to reach learning goals that they may not have believed they were able to reach. Authentic praise and feedback in a trusting environment coupled with consistency and high expectations encourages students to reach their full potential. Any questions? Okay. This is Linda Duckworth, everyone. All right. Marsha Schreiner is next. She is a title reading teacher out at Ogden, and she has been teaching since 2013 here in our district. She received the Outstanding Early Literacy Te Teacher Award in 2019 and Innovation Award winner in 2000, 2018. She said, I believe that every child can learn, and boy does she. Um, having worked with her before, I could put some of the most difficult students that I knew that I just wasn't sure how to reach in her room. And she just has the magic, you guys. 
It takes everyone involved with that child to create a lifelong learner. Not all ch children learn at the same rate or in the same way. My role as a teacher is to know where that child is in learning and what that child needs to learn. It is my job to ensure the child feels safe and that someone cares. I need to make education relevant, visible, and give corrective feedback. At the end of each day, my goal is for the child to learn more, retain more, and utilize the lessons taught to do better than the day before. Marcia Schreiner. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Laura Sapp. Laura is a math educator at MHS West. She has been in the district since 2009. Some of the things that have highlighted her career here in USC 83 include Goldstein Excellence in Teaching Award in 2018, nominee for Teacher of the Year, Manhattan High School 2019, Engineering and STEM Teacher of the Year, Kansas Society of Professional Engineering in 2015, and the 2011 and 2014 Bob Jack Excellence in Teaching nominee. Something that stood out that she wrote was, I believe in the importance for teachers to be facilitators of learning, a desire to challenge my students to think for themselves in a diverse and ever-changing world, actively encouraging them to develop as individuals. My classroom is a space where students feel safe to share their thoughts, ideas, building self-confidence to take risk during the learning process. It is essential to support the learning of all students. I strongly believe that instruction should be adapted and modified to reach the unique learning needs of my students. Expectations remain high and each student is challenged. Lessons should reflect learner diversity, which includes learning styles as well as social social, cultural, and linguistic differences. Students are fully engaging in their learning and can apply their knowledge and make personal connections. Thank you. Okay, one more. We got Angie Alvarez. Yes, thank you. And I don't believe she's here tonight, okay. Seventh grade teacher, math at Eisenhower Middle School. Oh, Jesus. Um, sorry, she has been in our district for 22 years. Some of the things that have highlighted her career include being MTSS building leadership team representative, math department lead, book study facilitator with KSU Math Institute, QPA building accreditation co-chair, MTSS and PLC planning committee, book study facilitator, or something else, advanced education, accreditation chairperson, and yearbook sponsor. She wrote, it may be cliche, but teaching is so much more than the content of our lessons. It is the treasured colleagues and the atmosphere we create together to provide a rich learning environment for our students and their families. So many times our classrooms are the only place students feel comfortable enough to be courageous risk takers without the fear of rejection or embarrassment. The sense of love and belonging is vital for real learning and growth. They must believe that they are worthy and it is up to us to ensure this happens for all students. We must meet them where they are at and guide them towards their greatest potential. Most of all, we must love them. That wraps up our 2019 Teacher of the Year nominations and are celebrating what's right for 2019. <laughs> never fear, there's never a shortage of great educators in our district. And so we'll be rolling out some more um, in the future for the 2020 um, nominees. But uh, as we looked over this year's, there's so many that talked about the importance of relationships and the emotional well-being of our students. And as you talk to any teacher in our district, this has been a huge priority. And so we are really grateful for all the work and the strides that are be taking to meet those needs um, and support the staff. And just thank you for all that you are doing and will continue to do as we get through <laughs> these kind of wacky times. Thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for what you've been doing for your students for all these years and what um, what comes ahead. We appreciate you and we're glad that you came tonight so we could see you in live and in person. Thank you very much.
All right, we're to board comments and I'm gonna start with Kurt and work my way around. I'll be very brief. And um, Well, first of all, I just, you know, I wanted, I, I was gonna say something like along, I can't say it as elegantly as Jardine did, but uh, uh, awesome, I, <laughs> I know, well, yeah, I, I don't know if I could have that much emotion, but you know, thank you for what you said. It was just perfect, but uh, you know, but you know, I just wanna say that, you know, we, we've all been hearing from a lot of people and, and it seems like it's, you know, some people say we should open school as always. Some people say we shouldn't open school at all. And, and it seems like every time you read an article, the next one contradicts the one you just read before. And, and I like to tell a lot of my friends, you know, stay off of social media and just, you know, we're doing our own thing. You know, we got, we're going to do, we're doing what's best for staff and for our students. And, and that's our number one priority. And, and uh, there's lots of very smart people um, that have been working on this. So um, that's about all I got, but I'll just, and then add what Jardine said to the end of my comments. So thank you to all the staff. Thank you, Kristen. Well, I'll to piggyback off Jardine and um, the great reminders of how many wonderful teachers we have in our district through Ashley's presentation with what is right. Um, when I had to text my own two children today with the governor's um, announcement and I got a curse word from my high school students and a, that's a whole nother month from my incoming freshmen. Um, I know the kids are ready to go back and we all know that and everybody knows that um, I think personally that we should see these extra three weeks as a gift from the governor. Um, however it shakes out and when contracts can start and everything, I think we know we could have done a great job as we said on August 12th, but give our teachers two more weeks. And I think they'll knock it out of the park. So I think we just have to see this as a gift and know it's going to be a couple more weeks of inconvenience for a lot of families. Um, but in the long run, I think that we will be doing what's right for our kids and for our staff and keeping everybody healthy and safe. And I think we have to, as a community, and as a state, keep in mind that really this is the time to flatten the curve. We said a lot, we talked about it a lot in March, but there wasn't much curve yet to flatten in Kansas. But now this is why she did this, is that we've got to get things under control if we're going to open up the buildings. And I've been so proud of Manhattan since the governor's mandate, even though regardless of what county commissioners have done across the state, not just here, um, I think since that weekend, I have seen in the community a great increase in people using masks voluntarily. And we have to keep that up, especially as key state students come back to town and start moving into their apartments in the next couple of weeks. We just know we're gonna have a whole nother wave to prepare for. And we all are, are working so hard. We want our kids in the schools. So whatever we can do to support one another and make sure people are following the rules, we all have to do it. So I challenge everyone um, to keep up the good work and uh, keep wearing your masks. Thanks. Thank you. Daryl. Well, just ditto on what Jardine said earlier. Uh, it was great. and. There has been a lot of work from a lot of people, and we all truly appreciate that. Um, no matter what happens to Pika and how they, things pan out or anything else, our people have done a lot of work, and it's just appreciated. I also wanted to note, uh, as we are naming our elementary school after Oliver Brown from the landmark Brown versus Board of Education, that uh, Ruth Scales Everett who was also a part of that landmark uh, case, passed away last week at the age of 80, and it was her mother uh, that was one of the actual participants. Vivian Scales uh, was one of the 13 participants in that landmark case. I just thought it noteworthy tonight that we brought that forward. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you bringing that forward. Thank you. Brandy. Okay, I don't know if anyone said it, but isn't it great to be back? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just really appreciate the fact that we can you know, find a way to be here in person. And I know that we have some uncertainties, but I also know that um, everything that was just said about what's, what's right is um, those teachers all literally said that it's more than just education. And um, there's a sense of belonging in often their classrooms um, are a place of safety and love for those children. And um, just to remind everyone that our school buildings are more than just a building. 
and um, how important it is to be a community. And no matter what parents decide that our district is doing the very, very best we can um, to provide the safest opportunities for our children. And um, I'm excited for the fall. So um, even though I wasn't, I was probably more like uh, Kristen's children <laughs> today <laughs> when I got the news from my neighbor because I was working. Um, uh, I will be very excited um, after Labor Day to see what transpires. So thank you very much. I won't cry again, but I just wanted to say, um, I just repeat again, thank you guys for all your hard work. Um, and I know that we can't necessarily comment on public comment, but I, I would like to, to have at some point some of those concerns that were raised brought back to us to just see kind of where we're at with that. Um, I, I think that's important that we say that, that that we want to hear that. And, and I know you guys are going to do that, but I just wanted to say it out loud for people to know that we're going to look at that and, and make sure that things are right so everybody's healthy and safe at school. Okay. Yes, Katrina. Thank you. Do you have any board comments for us right now? Hi there, yes. Um, thanks for sitting up with me, everybody, uh, being remote. I'm dealing firsthand with what it's like to uh, uh, have to get testing and then be quarantined. So it's highlighting for me, I'm getting a front row seat into the need for rapid testing. And, uh, I have a feeling that until our country has able, is able to speed up tests, um, this is what it will look like because the uh, life is shut down until test results are back or shut down within my, the world is right now. Uh, I echo the sentiment and the comments of everyone. Um, and what I would just implore our district administration to continue to do is over communicate um, because I'm sure that just like any board members, uh, my email and text messages have uh, have been uh, on the rise over these past few days as there are so many questions. Uh, and I appreciate the district's efforts to continue to push out information uh, as much as they can with this rapidly developing situation. Uh, and we're going to have to continue to do that. And for any of the, the parents or uh, family members that are paying attention to this information, uh, I would say just continue to check back in with this the district website because I think our district is trying to put out information as uh, frequently as possible. Uh, and the only, the last thing that I'll, I'll say, I'll echo, I'm pretty sure that that was Kristen that made the comment about um, uh, maybe the reluctance of the county commissioners to put out a strong map statement. Um, I think that that's how we're going to have to continue to lead by example is by strongly recommending folks wear masks and conduct proper hygiene. That's what most of us, um, uh, or many of us, I wouldn't say no, uh, many of us in this community have understood to be the path forward. And I really want our kids to go back to school uh, in as many, uh, as in, and to get back to normal. Whatever that normal looks like is going to be different. But we can certainly speed things up by adhering to mass guidelines, um, strongly encouraging our friends and our neighbors and our family members to adhere to those guidelines. That's all I've got tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I was also happy to finally be able to come and be here in person tonight because I've had a card for the Board of Education sitting on a piece of furniture in my house most of the summer. It is from the Woodrow Wilson staff that they signed for us uh, pre-spring break that then was in their staff room for quite some time until they were able to get back into the building and then clean out their rooms. And then I had a teacher that uh, dropped it by the house for me to share with the board. And I just didn't feel like Zoom, a little Zoom room, like I think Paula said, it just doesn't capture it. Aww. So, um, from their staff, I'll just read the main part. It says, we appreciate all the time you sacrifice to save our students, or to serve our students, <laughs> well, well yeah. <laughs> and staff in USD 383. We know, we know it is no small thing, Woodrow Wilson. So I just love how um, 
in the midst of our teachers taking care of our kids, that they also looked outward and shared that with us. So I'll pass that down and around for everybody to get a chance to look at. <clears throat> and I just really do appreciate it. I'm, 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 I like to get stuff out of my house, but maybe I might miss seeing that right by my front door. It was a really nice reminder of the relationships, especially as we've now moved out of Woodrow Wilson and I won't be there so often anymore. For my um, continuing, I have a couple other comments that I'd like to make. Um, we've been talking about or kind of working towards Jardine and Dr. Wade and I, and we've mentioned it here, talking about um, some training or some work for our fall retreat and um, working on um, culturally competent work or equity work, um, kind of based off of or springboarding from the training that Jardine and I went to at KSB in the fall that was meaningful to us. And then also just kind of being responsive to where we are as a nation right now and as a community and wanting to, to dig in more into that, um, that work and then also aligning it with where we are with our uh, strategic plan that we have those things itemized out in our in our uh, strategic plan that we are a district that values that equity and that that I think is an opportunity for us as a board to really dig into what that means so that when we um, want our educators to be doing it we're we're we are walking alongside them on that journey and so we, um, Jardine reached out to KASB to talk with them about some possibilities of training for us as a board and also communicating with Dr. Wade about inviting um, however much of his administrative team is, is appropriate and can make happen, that we could do that together or however that might work. Um, so it's not just us, but it's also we can expand it out to a larger group. So she's been, she communicated with um, Marcia Wiesman at KASB about some training for us. And, and before I have her, we ask her to kind of flesh it out more for us. I wanted to get some feedback from you guys and make sure that we're on board with it because it's not just straight out here. It is not just talking about doing a one evening conversation and then we're done with it. Um, for us to live it, it's it would be more involved than that. And so what Marcia described for us would be um, three sessions total, one that could be a evening. So the first session would be about a three hour session, which would kind of fall in alignment with what our typical fall retreat would be. And then two six hour sessions that would probably, I would suggest, I think Jardine would suggest we would explore if we could do it on a Saturday or a weekend so that people aren't having to miss that much work, or it just might be a little bit easier for us to accommodate that. So the suggestion from Marsha was that we could do that three hour training um, in October, late September, or October, October would probably be easier for them to accommodate. And then the first six hour training in late October or early November, and then the last one would be in February. So spaced out a bit because there's a lot of content in each of those things. And, and part of the goal is that there's time for it to sit and process and people to do some of their own work and do some of their own thinking about it um, before they make those decisions or before we move on to the next step. So um, wanting to get some feedback from folks if that's something that they would be open to doing and if we can pursue that further for us to do for some development for us as a group. Kurt? I was reading the card. What was the topic that it would be? Essentially, it would be working on cultural competency and equity. Oh. Is that, is that kind of aligned with what uh, the Lawrence School District is, does with the... Uh, uh, I, do, I don't think Midwest? it's... It's not the same training as what they do. I mean, it's... But I think that it um, probably... Kurt and I have talked with some folks over at USD Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> 497. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever their number yeah, is. Lawrence, yeah. At Lawrence. We've talked with them because they're they're farther along in this conversation than we are. They've been working on it for over 10 years. And so um as as folks have said, those collaborations are great. And so they've got some processes and some trainings that they do with their staff all the time. 
and and this probably wouldn't replicate that or be that necessarily because they're talking through a, a pretty system wide process. But when when we talked about it, one of the things that um, who what whoever it was talked about was that we can't expect our district, our students, our teachers to be in one place if the board's not there too. Dr. Stubblefield. Did. Dr. Stubblefield, I think, talked about that. That that again, and and yeah. Katrina said it tonight. We've we've heard it so many times that we lead by example. That what we set as a board as our priorities, we need to live out. And and this isn't a statement that we're not all good people or anything like that. It's just something that that is a good conversation to have and a good thing for us to do that self exploration as we're asking our teachers and staff to do the same thing. So I realize that um, six hours, two different times on a weekend is a different kind of commitment than what we've maybe done in the past. So I wanted to make sure that we could be on board with that before. And then, and I don't have any dates or anything. I just wanted to to see some nods or some okays before we get that, go that direction. Okay, Katrina, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, Carl, are you just, you're just looking for, um, general feedback on if this is the right direction, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So I wholeheartedly think that this is the right direction. I appreciate that you stepped forward to um, uh, reach out and get this ball rolling. Um, I think that we've seen not just around our board table, but also in our society that um, this, is, this is an ongoing topic. And as leaders in our community, uh, in the school district, I think we have a responsibility to be at the forefront of, of this charge and make sure that we understand um, this topic of discussion thoroughly so that we can articulate um, our position as, as a board and as individuals much better than maybe we could even in years past. Okay, thank you. So if we're good with that, then I'll probably look at Jardine and say, will you continue the conversation with Marcia since you've already started that? Yes. And then loop in Dr. Wade. Great, thank you. Continuing from that conversation, and again, um, I, th I think we've, we've hit on it in a lot of different times tonight, and um, talking about where we are in the world of COVID, where we are in our nation as a whole. Um, I would also like tonight to talk with the board and um, get some consensus if possible in reference to asking Dr. Wade and communicating with Dr. Wade to bring us um, an examination and a recommendation about the MHS symbol of the Indian. I absolutely realize that um, there's a whole lot going on right now, that the, the district has a lot on their plate as everybody else does. But I also realize when um, the summer started and I read a statement on behalf of the board that said that we are supporting equity and we are supporting all of our students and we're standing behind what that means that um, it was not lost on me that there's a portion of our student population and of our community who feels exempted of that or excluded from that. It was not lost on me. And we've known for a, since before I moved to Manhattan, that this is a conversation that has cycled through. We've, I've not been through it as a board member before, um, but it has been to the board multiple times before. And I know some of you guys have been through that. And um, I don't, I don't ask this lightly, but I also recognize that there are times in, in life where there are just points of where, where things are to a point where you've got to just look at it again. You've got to come back and say, we need to look at it again. We need to have a fresh look. We need to recognize where we are. We need to um, go forward with it. 
Daryl? We just went through this whole thing. Just did. The whole community. We had all sorts of evaluations, all sorts of discussions, everything. Big discussions over at the high school. This just happened. Just because you weren't there and a couple of the others weren't there, there's a lot of documentation you can read. We do not need to be going through this whole thing already again. It took a great deal of our time that we don't have. So I'm saying no, absolutely not again. Okay. Kurt? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we did spend two years on this recently. And, I, and honestly, I, I mean, I think we came up with a pretty good compromise. I mean, you know, we went through the... The choice, I mean, we, you know, it's not a mascot, but we went through the choice, had the students pick. We, well, you all know what the results were, and, and we made the steps towards uh, creating the curriculum um, in the school towards Native American um, education, and, and we've named the commons over there. So I think we've taken the steps that we said we were, that we would in, in, in the, the very beginning. So I was, I was personally was satisfied with, with uh, what we, their final solution that we came up and I really would not be interested in, in uh, approaching it again, but just. Okay, Jardine. Um, I totally understand that. And I think I expected that to be your responses. Let's get real. I think everybody in this room would have said that that would have been your response. Um, I think that what happened before was a step in the right direction, but it was a step in a process. And as a person who personally, I would say that I am in a different place in terms of cultural competency, knowledge on racial equity, inclusivity, I feel that it was just a step and that there's more work to do. And I think that as this training that we're discussing is gone through, I would hope that you would be able to see that that is the, the end result that needs to be achieved based on learning more about what racial equity means, about what systemic racism is. I think you just don't have that knowledge. And that's through no fault of your own at this point. So I, I think that with more knowledge, hopefully your heart will change. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So I am in favor. Kristen. I've had quite a few people in the community reach out to me on this issue recently. I think because I wasn't at the board, people didn't, on the board at the time, people didn't know where I stood on it. I feel like we still have not met everything the district said they were gonna do two and a half years ago. I think we're still a long ways to go. We've talked about some of the steps and things we're exploring, but we still have not done a great job in educating our students more about native people, indigenous people in our country. And I feel like we're in a position where when you look at all the changes that are happening in society down to the Washington Redskins, I mean, just on NPR last week, they said the second most derogatory term is Indians. And I was talking to friends of mine who graduated from Manhattan High School who live in other parts of the country, work in New York City, and they said they told them their friends that they went to a high school that had Indians as a mascot, and they could not believe that there were still schools in the United States with human mascots. And I think when we look as a society and as a community to market ourselves to talent all over the world, to try to get them to want to come and bring their families and children to Manhattan, Kansas, I think there's a lot of people who would be shocked in this day and age. And I totally understand that this board, two and a half years ago, said they weren't going to take it up for 10 more years. And I've had people remind me of that as well. But I do think the world isn't exactly where we were two and a half years ago either. So I think that we can't just ignore it and not talk about this for seven and a half more years. Can you? That's okay. kind. Of, I, could, I could be really flippant there. We yeah, say that so it's a you term, know, but everybody in the world sees it. Mascot. I graduated from Manhattan High School, and I would say my high school's mascot was an Indian, regardless of whether that's the term that we've said it is. That's what society considers 
a mascot. Brandy, do you have anything you'd like to weigh in with? Um, I, I understand the social repercussions of this. But I do know that it has been addressed in the past. I wasn't a part of that. Um, I tend to agree with Kurt and Daryl and just the fact that there's people on both sides of this. And not saying one is right and one is wrong. I think Jardine is also correct in saying that, you know, we all have different opinions. And um, I, think, I think those need to be respected on both sides. I don't see an issue with looking at it. But at this point, we don't even have the steps done for what we are going to do um, with the curriculum, as I understand. You know, we still need to uh, address what's, what's already been decided. And um, at this point, I would not be in favor of, um, of taking it, just not just because a few people want it, but because it has been addressed over and over again. And just because sometimes you don't like the outcome doesn't mean you can continue to um, have to address it. Um, if, if that was the outcome, um, I respect that. I, I don't necessarily say I agree with it, but I do respect it. And so, I mean, if there's, a, if there's an issue that people really feel like it needs to be addressed, I, I respect that too. But, you know, that's the outcome that, that the community has decided and the board in the past has decided. And this is recent. So I, I tend to go with Kurt and, and Daryl on this one. I'm going to ask Katrina and then come back to Kristen. Katrina, would you like to weigh in? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just to comment on, on Brandy's last statement, you're right, Brandy, that this has continued to be discussed over and over again. Uh, in fact, I believe that it's been discussed five times since the 1970s. Uh, and each time we as a community and as a school district have continued to grow and evolve and, and change. We change with with the time, so to speak. Um, and I think that even in the past two and a half years, we're continuing to grow and evolve as a society, closer to home as a community. Um, I know that even at my own home, when I look back to statements uh, that maybe we were comfortable with uh, when I was growing up, those are no longer acceptable statements. And I'm talking about race, gender, uh, et cetera. Things that we used to think are, were acceptable, as we grow our cultural competency, we learn that those things are not acceptable. And although court, current board members were not voting members during the last decision on this topic, it doesn't mean that we didn't go through those discussions. Uh, in fact, I would say that three members, Carla, Jardine, and myself, uh, were running for the board position as this debate was, was raging. So we got a front row seat, participated in many of those discussions, most of those discussions probably, and read all of the material uh, that was put forth to the board at that time. And I would venture to say that Kristen uh, uh, probably lived through that as well because uh, she lived in the community at that time. So don't think that just because that we weren't on the board doesn't mean that we weren't paying attention and didn't have um, an opinion informed opinion on the subject then, or an informed opinion now. Uh, I too would not have been satisfied with how far we've come. We, the board at the time, put forth the best effort at that time uh, to try to set things straight, but we, we have not carried through on all of those, those pieces. And we as a board have a responsibility to continue to move this forward. Uh, I know that this probably is the best time. We have a lot of irons in the fire, but when it comes to discussion on what's right, there's never a right time to do the right thing. So I support Carla's request to, doc to ask Dr. Wade for a recommendation, and um, Carla, I hope that you move forward with that. 
Kristen, did you have another comment? I guess one just logistical comment. Um, we've been told this is the last time Manhattan High School will be able to expand. We're getting ready to do a large 30 million whatever dollar, that huge project to tear up and renew um, our high school. And if we're gonna have to do some things, this might be a good timing if the change were to be made. So it feels like a appropriate time. By all means, I know we've got much more pressing business like what the first day of school is. Um, and we don't need to get too sidetracked at this point in time, but I do think that that's another thing I have to think about is just logistics. Okay. I do believe that there are enough of us, there's four of us who have asked for it to go forward to Dr. Wade for a recommendation. So we would, I would ask for you to do that, to come back to the board with a recommendation for us. Obviously it would be something that would receive public comment and be subject to future meetings. Um, I am not proposing that we do large community gatherings again. I do think that we are recent enough in that time period that there was a lot of work done that we have access to. We have access to that information and that material. And so, um, although I, I will say, I mean, obviously it would be an agenda item that would be open for public comment in a, in a board meeting. I would ask that Dr. Wade, um, on the timeline he finds appropriate, come back to us with a recommendation if you're comfortable with, with that, sir. I can sure do it. Uh, just tell me when you want my recommendation and you will have it. Okay. So Thank I can you. do it really any time. Okay. I'd like to make one suggestion. Yes, You have a much larger meeting space because if you're asking for or allowing public comment, you're going to have it. I will work through that. I will work through the regulations for board comments and we'll work through a process for, for that. Um, obviously also people are welcome to make written comments as well and can submit those. And we can um, apply our board rules for public comment and make sure that we allow that access. Okay. I realize that this is a hard topic and I struggled with whether or not to bring it tonight. I struggled with how to bring it. Um, and as Katrina said, as folks have said, there's no good time for this, no matter when it would be. For some folks, it would be too soon. And for other folks, it would be not soon enough. And so I don't know that there's any great answer that, that makes everybody happy here. Um, I just, I have to do what I feel is right here and that's why I brought it to the board. I also do think that, that we do have a responsibility for our students and the longer I look at our strategic plan with what our, our objectives are, with what we say we stand by, I feel like um, we need to take a look at that so thank you guys and we will get through this. I appreciate it. I don't have any other comments. So that takes us to the food service annual report. If anybody had any questions for Stephanie, I see you're here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for everything that you and your staff have done this year. It's been a monumental task that you guys have very much stood up for. Are there any questions for Stephanie? Okay. Did you have anything else you wanted to highlight for us? No. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. All right. That takes us to new business. We have a bus purchase. That is why Andrea is probably here this evening. Um, is there a, does anybody need to hear from Andrea or is there a motion? Jardine, I saw your hand. I move to give final approval for the purchase of one new SPED bus from the Kansas State Department of Education, Kansas Bus Purchasing Program for Master Teachers Transportation in the amount of $70,860 and three new 71 passenger buses from the Kansas State Department of Education, Kansas Bus Purchasing Program from Midwest Transit in the amount of $261,744. Okay. And second from Brandy, 
Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll call the vote. All in favor? Katrina? Yes. Okay, motion carries 7 0. Uh, Frank, Ber Frank Bergman HVAC upgrades and fire sprinkler addition design services with Matt. Matt's here in the room tonight. Is there any questions for Matt? Okay, Kurt. No questions. Anyone else? Mm -mm. I move mm -hmm. to get final approval to the proposal submitted by BG Consultants of Manhattan, Kansas for the design of the HVAC and fire sprinkler upgrades for Frank Bergman in amount of $140,755. Okay. Second from Kristen. All in favor? Katrina? Yes. All right. And the last is board committee and school assignments. Um, there was one change that was in the additional information from Diane, and it was just me and Kurt swapping, um, swapping. Thank you. Woodrow. For Bergman. For Bergman. Sorry. All right. Is there a motion to approve those? Jardine. Yeah, there we go. I move to approve the 2020-2021 board committee and school assignments. Okay. Is there a second? Second from Kristen. Daryl, did you have a question or? Okay. All right. All in favor? Katrina? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries 7-0. For old business, we have Manhattan High School West Campus card access and gateways purchase and installation. And Trish is back in the room if there's any questions for her. Jardine? I don't have a question. You can sit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I move to get final approval for the proposal to add or change existing door access and add gateways for NDE hardware at Manhattan High School West Campus in the amount of 334000 $834 from CBS Door and Hardware, LLC. Okay. Is there a second? Kurt? All in favor? Katrina? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Anthony Middle School Construction Alternates. Trisha, again. Did anybody have any questions for her? Kurt? I'm guessing a motion. I move to give final approval for the ad alternates number three and number four for Anthony Middle School from McCown Gordon Construction in amount of $281,359. Okay, second from Kristen, all in favor? Katrina. Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Eisenhower Middle School Construction Alternates. Tricia, or a motion? Well, someone else did. Yep, Jardine? I move to give final approval for the ad alternates three and four for Eisenhower Middle School. Oh, other school. Okay. From McCall and Gordon Construction in the amount of $281,359. Okay. A second from Kurt. All in favor? Katrina? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. And last item on old business is budget planning for 2020 2021. Lou is in the room. Can I ask a question? Hey, Trisha, before you go, were those numbers really the exact same number? Is that right? Okay. They normally are different, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, okay. All right, Lou, you've got an update for us.
Thank you. Some of our biggest, sorry, Michelle, some of our biggest tax distributions come to us in, in early June. We get 25% of our tax distribution, so the ending cash balance is always inflated. To not have too much money sitting in, sitting in the bank, we have to put $10 million in KMIP, Kansas Municipal Investment Pool, before June 30th so that we have all the right coverages and so on. So, but that's just because of the way the, the tax distribution cycle runs in the state of Kansas. This is the final year in transfers report. I mentioned this, you, this to you that this would come back when we had the uh, transfers for you at the last June meeting. The only other transfer we made down towards the bottom, the total final transfers, there was an additional $99,569 that went from general fund to contingency reserve. So the figure up at the top that was the original projected at 1.1 million. And that was the only change that we made as far as final transfers was that additional money as we closed out the books for the year. We didn't do any in supplemental general. Uh, we aided into that cash balance quite a bit this year. And so we left the balance that was there to try and help with the mill levy uh, instead of transferring out all the ath remaining authority that we had. This is a little bit of a look at our history and select funds this isn't all funds but in some of our main funds and the main point on this uh if you look at them as you go down the list some of our balances went down some the second one there local option budget i.e supplemental general you know we ate into that unencumbered cash balance by almost half and that was why we didn't transfer more money out of that fund uh at risk went up quite a bit from 1.8 to 2.5 a couple more down there that was primarily due to the shutdown our buildings didn't get to use all, I mean, we did salaries the rest of the spring, but there was a lot of monies that, that they had allocated to them that didn't get spent. Uh, virtual ed was pretty flat. Food service, Stephanie was down a little over 230,000. That's a balance that, that uh, we're gonna have to watch going forward. And we even transferred about uh, a little over 50,000 into CARES money for some of the extra expense, COVID expenses that she had in the spring. So that one, but she's comfortable and feels like she'll be able to build that back up. Um, special ed, uh, it was a little bit up, but that was because we transferred a lot of money in at the end of the year. Um, contingency reserve was pretty flat. We, we put money into it, but we also had that large technology purchase, but we'll see if that, you know, if we get some Sparks monies to help with that, or if we want to charge some of that to CARES or how that goes as well. All told, then just for those funds, we only went up 2% in the cash balance this year compared to last year. You can see we had a pretty big bump, bump last year, um, but it's pretty flat this year. If you have any questions along the way, please speak up. Our calendar, just to show you that we're still moving along. Um, like I said, the budget review was yesterday at 2. I think I was one of the first five in the office at KSDE. To get the review done uh, saw Craig yesterday afternoon and uh, they were back him and Mr. Dennis were back and forth between the state board meeting that was going on and, and doing budget reviews in their office um, we will give you a first look at mill levy projections tonight obviously for the next meeting on the 5th you'll have the full budget document and uh, we'll need to approve the budget to go to publication with notice of hearing uh, for then the next meeting in August and for adoption. But we have to do the approval of the notice of hearing at the August 5th meeting. It has to go in the paper. There's a 10-day window that it has to be between the time it's published and before you can come back and have your public hearing and adopt your budget. So that would project us then to be uh, at the August 19th meeting, then do our public hearing at, at 6.30 and then have the adoption of the budget as an agenda item, action item later that evening. And by statute, it has to be submitted to the state and to the county clerk's office by August 25th by state statute, which we should have no problem. We've been crunching it for a couple of years, but th this year it's, it's not a problem meeting that timeline. This one's hard to see a little bit, and, and I can try and blow it up a little bit for you. Uh, Bottom line is, and, and you've got this in your packet. Oh, it's not, it's not scrolling on the screen for me. What's it doing? If, oh no. 
I got dropped. I lost Kermser completely. I don't even have Kermser as an option. Oh, it's back. It's trying to connect. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The number comes back. On that worksheet, and that's just uh, what's kind of called the Form 150 that you've seen before that I use to estimate and project the budget numbers. Once everything went into the software, uh, the authority increased a little bit from what I'd projected, um, but that is that is number, and that document as you have it, uh, is based on the numbers and matches the numbers that's in the budget draft and in the soft, software at this point. I'm not getting anything. Okay. Okay. And really, the numbers are down towards the bottom right there, and you can see that that. Our net increase was about 2.5 million, a little under 2.5 million compared to our budget authority from last year. And as we've talked about all the way through in our budget plan and so on, of course, the big, biggest chunk of that is unfortunately going to go to health, the health insurance increase at 24.2%. Uh, that's going to eat up the vast majority of that increase, unfortunately. Okay, go ahead to the next one, whoever's driving now. Is it Matt? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. This is just an update of the bar graph you've seen before and just has the updated numbers. The blue section is the general fund. You can see it grew a little bit and the yellow section is the supplemental general. But you can see there's a fairly steady increase the last two or three years. And of course, that's a result of the Gannon lawsuit and the, and the funding commitment that the state legislature is, has made. Again, as we've talked about, our concern is this is on paper. I mean, it's our budget authority and on paper, it's great. It looks good. The numbers would put us in a good position. Our concern is whether or not the state's actually able to fulfill that commitment. And the governor has put forth a plan of how she would fill the $650 million deficit. She put out num uh, a package that would be up close to a $700 million. That's still the finance council and some of them are still chewing on that as to whether or not uh, those things are acceptable. So, and there was minor cuts to small things. There wasn't any major cuts to the base funding or the or anything that would go in the base funding for you formula or allotments that we've talked about. Uh, so we'll see if that um, actually comes to reality as we move through the year. This is a capital outlay uh, computation that has based on our assessed valuation and the figures that you saw. So on the very far right side there, blow that up and yeah, there you go, Matt. Thank you. You can see that our assessed valuation went up 1.94% and just under 730 million. Uh, and at eight mils, which is the max you can have by law for capital outlay, we would generate um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $5.8 million. And that's accounting for some delinquency rates and some things in there as well. So it'd be an increase of about the bottom number there, an increase of about $111,000 in capital outlay authority compared to last year. Okay, go ahead. This is a cash flow projection for capital outlay. It's a tracking chart that we use. And Matt, you and I have to sit down and go through this. We, we have to, we have to review this numbers are right but we have to make sure there's there's a uh, you'll see the one number scroll down a little bit Matt if you would on the far right eleven million seven hundred and fifty thousand one sixty in planned expenditures this year compared to about six point four that we did this year that's it looks like a huge jump and it is but if you remember we've been saving back for some big projects some big roofing projects those roofing projects hit this year right. And so we're pulling huge savings out, and that's why that number is so inflated is, as we've got a couple of huge uh, roofing projects. Still, the, the numbers on the far right 
we still have 1.181 in unreserved cash even with that projected spending at the end of next year. We always set, want to have a million dollars kind of set aside for property acquisition and have at least a million dollars in unreserved cash in our plan. So even with that, we're setting okay going forward. So that's the reason for that worksheet is to kind of evaluate that to make sure we've got with the plan savings and the uh, property acquisition to make sure we've got the, the unreserved cash or the unallocated, if you will, in the fund as far as cash flow purposes. But Matt and I are going to sit down and go through and make sure I've got all the savings allocated right and planned and, and the figures are all correct. And I believe they are, but him and I need to, need to do a final review of that. And then here's Matt's capital outlay plan that he, he had uh, presented to you earlier. And Matt, yes, all the account numbers are in there for you. So you can extract him from that. He's got all the account numbers for when he gets to the projects going down the road. This is one that he uses all the way through. And I plug the account numbers in for him once it goes into the budget process. So that's kind of just the details of all the things that lead to that 11 million figure in the expenditures that you just saw. Here we go then to the mill levies. This is in the draft and from the software, as I said, uh, last year we were at 62.14 mills in our final certified mill levy. In the draft, the 20 mills general fund is set by state statute. That's just the, that's the general state aid amount that's set. LOB is at 15.54, that's up. Uh, part of that is because our cash balance went down. And part of that was our valuation didn't grow maybe as much as we hoped it would. Adult Ed's at zero. We had our two years that we had the, the we flow through the money to MATC and that by the agreement that's done. So that's a 0, 0.0. So that's 42 hundredths of a mil that goes away. The eight mils for capital outlay, we're recommending that to stay the same. Uh, we're, we've grown the amount that we're putting into technology, other things, and, and we need, need, need that money. Uh, to keep that cash flow that we were just talking about in that chart. Bonded interest is down a little bit. Uh, we had pretty good cash flow in that fund. Uh, hopefully we should be able to keep it around that. I mean, uh, Dustin and, and his team at, at uh, Piper Sandler have projected it to be around 18.47 and be flat for a few years, but we think we can go there and still be adequate with cash flow. We still have some of that premium money that was a part of the sale uh, that we can use in the future if we need to to manage mill levy and if we don't use it and there's three million a little over three million left in the premium money it could go into the project fund if we don't need it for mill levy management so we'll continue to monitor that as we go along it just depends you know if our how our assessed valuation continues to go and some of those kind of variables that are part of it special assessment uh, we dropped that to zero for this year we had 1500 hundredths of a mill last year We've got about a little over $100,000 in that fund. Uh, the only specials we may have may be out at Oliver Brown at this point, and we, th if we feel there's adequate money in the fund to cover anything that would be there. If not, uh, then we've got plenty of contingency if there's any difference. So we don't feel like we need to have a levy there this year. So that puts us at a total of 61.64 mills proposed for fiscal year 21, which is a drop of 5 tenths of a mill compared to last year. Squeeze that, yeah. This is just a chart that shows this is the bond and interest fund, just the mill levy. And you can see it was pretty flat there for a while after the 2008 issue. It jumped on us last year, which of course was planned. We had to make begin to make the first payments on the 2018 issue and it's down a little bit for uh, this year in, in the proposal. This is another one that just has the mill levies and shows it a little bit different way and it has a little more history with it. Uh, the part of this one that I wanted to share, Matt, if you would scroll down to the bottom. There's some explanations here of the mills, the local option budget, the dates that, that some of the resolutions were passed and those type of things. Basically, at this point, all of our resolutions for taxing authority are continue, what's called continuous and permanent except for adult ed. And when the last time the board reauthorized that, it was for a five-year window. If situation stays the way it is, that you know, it goes on for the next three years and expires and we don't have to worry about it. And we wouldn't have to worry about mill levy resolutions because local option is continuous and permanent. Capital outlay is continuous and permanent. Bond and interest and special assessments are set by the board based on your budget 
planning on an annual basis. So we wouldn't have to have the renewals. We used to have to kind of track that and make sure because if you let one of those expire and didn't renew your authority, you can't do it. And there's been districts in the state that have done that and it cost people jobs uh, that were in a position similar to mine. <laughs> but you, do, you, can't, you can't let that authority go away. That's pretty important. And then there's a little bit of a, of a assessed valuation tax computation in that bottom box that shows what our final was for last year, about 716 million. And that's our final actual certified total. Our estimated total is about 730 million for this year. That's subject to review and is finalized by the county clerk's office late October, early November, when we'll get final numbers. Right now, it's about a 1.94% increase. And it won't fluctuate a lot, but it may change a little bit. It usually most maybe five one hundredths of a percent change from what they estimate. They're usually pretty close. Uh, this is just a chart that shows the total mill levy history. Again, we've been pretty flat for the most part. Uh, jumped a little bit last year, as we noted, because of the bond issue and down just a tick this year uh, in, in our proposed mill levy recommendation for you. This is calculation we do, and this is an estimate by all means uh, that looks at uh, what would be the mill levy impact, the proposed mill levy impact on the average residence, uh, residential value, the most current residential, average residential value in Manhattan that from the extract last November is 212,500 for the average value of a home in Manhattan. So you look at how that plays out and with the mill levy that we're proposing, it would be a $3 a year increase. It's pretty flat. Slight increase because of increase in valuation, but for the most part, it's flat. The business one is a little bit different and the formula is a little, a little bit different. It'd be about $110 a year increase for a business. Uh, and that, I think I based that on a 2% increase in valuation because of our assessed valuation figure. There's different ways to go about that, but that's, but you can, you can look at those. And this is one we like to share with you. This is a group of school districts. This comes right from the state. These are the school districts that call, qualify for the cost of living funding that are, you have to be more than 1.25 or 25% above the average, uh, the statewide average in residential valuation to qualify for this. And Manhattan falls in that. We actually went down a little bit this year where we had fallen. Last year, we were over 2% about 2.32 if I remember right, we'd be down to 1.06% if we were gonna do the cost of living percentage in that far right-hand column. It's kind of interesting, you look at the very top, Johnson County, Blue Valley, average residential value of 474.7. Off the chart compared, I mean, the next one is DeSoto at 325. Now, it, it, that, that's an incredible variance there. and. Of course, even going all the way down to Goddard at 193,450, Rock Creek came into it, I think, about two years ago. They, they climbed into that group for the first time. Uh, but it, it's, you know, there, there's a lot of districts in there that we probably would, would consider benchmarking or comparison districts. Lawrence in there, Auburn Washburn's in there, Goddard, and some of those would be Gardner Edgerton would be similar districts to us. There's some, of course, that would be, you know, when you start talking about Shawnee Mission and some of those that are much, much larger than we are. Blue Valley, of course. But that's just some interesting information. And this last one then, I wanted to give you, this is a page from the actual draft of the budget document. This is what's called Code 99, the notice of hearing page. It gives you all the budget figures, the mill levies, and kind of what there would be. Now, one thing, you know, if you look at uh, right towards the bottom, it says, stop right there, Matt, if you would, and blow that up just a little bit. Okay, st stop there. The total USD expenditures, line 100. There's a total expenditures column, and then there's a transfers. You transfer from general fund and supplemental general fund to support all your other funds, i.e. special ed, uh, bilingual education, vocational education. So it, it almost becomes a double expenditure, if you will. So you, you take those transfers out and then your net expenditures would be 
at the figure of the 112 480 which would be an increase of about nine million dollars and of course again that's authority your authority is always more than what you're going to spend and we especially in building the budget with potential allotments out there looming we want to look at you know making sure that we've got enough authority in there that if we have to absorb some allotments we're not having to cut into critical programs so your authority is going to be much higher than what you're actually going to spend so that budget authority figure is always for lack of a better word it's somewhat padded but you do that for a couple of purposes you don't have to republish your budget for one thing capers you always make sure you've got enough in capers because you don't even get that money it comes in and they take it right back out the same day you don't want to have to republish your budget because of capers and so there's some of those kind of things uh, that are a part of it so it's really more reflective to look at what you actually spent the prior two years you know we've got 85 one in fiscal year 19 and 103 eight in fiscal year 20. of course that's that's a pretty big jump but most of that was our increase in salaries salaries and benefits for our employees that we gave last year so that's a quick summary of where we're at as i said you will have the entire budget document, all the supporting materials that go with it, everything uh, in your packet, and you won't get it in the additional meeting. You'll have it up front, uh, so you have time to review it before the next meeting. Kurt. So on the calendar, you indicated you wanted a board consensus tonight on the proposed on that proposal, and I guess I would. I mean, I guess I'm I'm in favor of this. I think it's uh, great that we're able to keep the mill levy flat. I mean, even though it's going down, but it technically goes because the tax evaluation goes up a little bit. But I think that's very nice that the average homeowner, it's only going to be a three dollar increase. So I'm, I would be happy to, uh, with this budget. OK, thank you. I'm seeing nods around the room. Katrina, I'm assuming you're nodding along with us. I'm following right along. I'm All right. Updates. Awesome. All right. Thank you. I think uh, that gets you your consensus. Yes. I just need to know if, if we're okay with this as the draft or if we needed options to bring back to you. But because, like I said, when we come back next time, we have to to approve the notice of hearing and publication and move forward. So we're, we're doing final reviews and we'll continue to just make sure. But I'm fairly comfortable at this point that uh, we have a budget landed, to be honest with you. Any other uh, questions or comments for Lou? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. That concludes our old business for the evening. For our next regular meeting items, we've got budget development, notification of the budget hearing, and classified handbooks. Um, we do need to have two executive sessions this evening, one for negotiations and one for personnel. Um, Negotiations is set for 20 minutes and personnel is set for 30. I would like for us to take a break in between that and give us a chance to stretch our legs. Um, so is 10 minute break sufficient for everybody? And then executive uh, session will meet back in here so that we can socially distance to do that. And the, the stream will go off. Jardine. Okay, I like to move that we take a 10 minute break and return to this room at 8.55 to begin executive session for 20 minutes to discuss current negotiations pursuant to the exception for employer-employee negotiations under COMA, and we return to this open session at whatever time that would be, 10 minutes from now, plus 20. 30 minutes. 30 so minutes it would be 9.15. 9.15. Yeah, we have to do separate That's questions. fine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wade, Eric Reed, and Lou Faust will join the board in executive session. Okay. There's our first motion with the second from Kurt. All in favor? Katrina? Yes. Okay. We've got that. 7-0. We will um, take that break and then reconvene for executive session.